please enjoy the day, get as much out of it as you possibly can. The one thing that we don't have is Stefan Gurney, who's the executive director of Norwich Bid, but fortunately we have him on video. Good morning and welcome. Thank you all very much for being here. Apologies that I can't be here to be part of uh, the City Conference this morning. Uh, unfortunately, I'm away, but I really wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for taking the time and energy to come here today. I really hope that it's a really good discussion and an opportunity to talk through all the things about putting Norwich on the map. This is Norwich Business Improvement District, part of our City Conversation Conferences. Uh, and this is focusing the visit Norwich on tourism and, and destination marketing and the opportunities for Norwich. So I'll now seamlessly hand over to my colleague Andrew Durney to talk you through some of the activities that have been and I hope that you have an amazing day. Speak to you all soon. Hi, good morning and uh, thanks to Stefan for the uh, introduction. Um, and it's great, uh, my thanks for everybody coming out uh, this morning and making the time to, uh, to join us. Um, now, shamelessly, what we'd like to do is tell you a little bit about the Business Improvement District until we get on to the uh, business of the, of the day. So I'm going to hook up with the uh, move us on. So the Norwich Business Improvement District is all about making Norwich bigger, bolder and better. And that's by getting loads of people to collaborate together across the city to make people want to come here, to, to visit the city, to work here and for businesses to feel able that they can grow and sustain their wealth here in the city. So it's really important that we keep thinking about how we do that and really important to understand how we get everyone working together because everyone's got a view on how we do that. And the great thing about Norwich is there's a lot of people who are passionate about the city, passionate about the area, and if we can make that coalesce into real, really good ideas, then the business improvement district can make them happen. So who, business improvement district, what are we all about? Well, first of all, we're a company. We are a we're not quite a PLC, but we are a company's house, and we exist for local businesses, and we are run by local businesses. So it's a democratic organisation. We're voted in every five years, and we started life in 2012, and we evolved from the Norwich City Centre Partnership, and we want to take it a step further and make it into something that actually could involve more businesses and do more things for the city. So we went out, uh, created the bid, and put it out to the businesses, and voted, and they voted it in 2012. So it was a vote of trust. Okay, we'll give you a chance, let's see how you get on. And we got on really well. And we got on so well, we went back to the businesses in 2017 and said we'd like another five year term. And they agreed. And we managed to widen our area to the Inner Ring Road so that uh, more businesses could get involved and we could have more influence over, over the city. And the businesses came back and said, look, 84% of us want you back in. And by rateable value, I think it was 90, 94%, 94% by rateable value said, yeah, we're in. And that means that all those businesses will give up 1% of their rateable value and put that into the business improvement district pot. And that gives the city a fund of five million pounds over five years. Now that is a huge amount of money and something you can make a difference with. And it's great sat around the board and I have the pleasure of being the chair of the board for the moment and it's great watching everyone collaborate. Competitors collaborate. You'll see people working in different parts of the retail business. You've got theatres, universities, you even have city and county councillors all working together to say, what can we do for the city to make it a place where people want to be, where businesses want to thrive, and where we can make a real difference? And I don't quote me on this, but from my day job, you can get things done really quickly. You know, you don't have to go through lots of decision processes. That, that board and the executive team run by Stefan and the team members you'll meet today can make things happen. So if you've got any ideas, come and see us. If you've got ways in which you think the city can evolve, bring them to us. So I'm going to play a quick video because it beats listening to me uh, about what we've actually been up to.
Yeah. <laughs> try and take some of that energy. That's just a small sample of the things that we get up to. We know we've got to promote like that. This city's great. We all know that. There's great stories to tell. There's great people doing fantastic things in the city. We've got great businesses. So how do we let people know? So one of the important things we've got to do is make sure we promote as much as we can in this city. We know that when people come, 74% of them want to come back again. So we have a history of welcoming, welcoming strangers into the city and we want to encourage people to come and experience it and see what it does. And unless we tell them Norwich is not a place you just pass through on the way to somewhere else, we've got to make it a real destination that they want to come and enjoy and come back again and again and again. And that's good for everybody. Not only for people visiting for the day, not only for retailers and people who are shopping, but for people coming to work as well. Because at the end of the day, people tell you, oh yeah, I'm coming to work for this company, I've got a great career, I want to do this and that. Well, actually, a large part of it, I want to go and live in that place. I want to go and experience what everyone else is loving, and I want to be part of it. And so it has a lot more other than just the immediate effect of uh, welcoming people into the city. So we're, we're keen that the media side of it uh, really engages with it. We're actively using social media. We're, we've created that brand, the City of Stories, under which we can pin all the great activities that we're doing. And we're going to take that to the next level as we go forward over the next couple of years so that people become really aware of what Norwich has to offer. The things that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, making people, once they arrive, that we're promoting what's going on in the city, that we've got the social media available to us, we've got the apps, we've got the website, we've even got the physical maps. So it's important that we address everybody's need, whatever access they've got to whatever information, that we're helping them engage with the city and helping to promote all the things that are going on within, within the actual uh, environments of uh, Norwich. Once they're here, you've got to have a great experience. I mean, we all know, don't we, all those parties we go to, there's some that make you smile and laugh and you want to go back again, and some think, I'm not going there again. Well, Norwich is definitely one of those places people are telling us, once we're here, it's great. And so what we have to do is hug people in to make sure that they remember their day in Norwich, and that's what they talk about when they next see their friends and family, is you've got to get up to Norwich. So that experience is so important, that first impression is so important. And the bid is going out of its way to make sure that whether it's the city hosts, uh, whether there's great events going on, people remember doing things in Norwich. And that's taking the children or the family around the hares, or, the, or whatever it is that we've got uh, trails going on, and uh, making sure that people really remember what Norwich is all about. So one of the things we're doing is making sure that we focus our efforts on key events. Head Out Not Home has been a big thing for us during the summer, uh, putting music onto the streets of Norwich and trying to create that, uh, that vibe to get people to stay in the city and experience it and love it for a little bit longer. And it's simple ideas like that, just done really well, that can help people. And we know from the feedback we've had that people are now coming in specially. Originally we set that up just to get people to stay in Norwich who have perhaps been in working or whatever during the day and then to stay a little bit longer. We've actually found that people are now making a day of it and coming in for the evening just so they can you know, understand Norwich and understand what's going on through the music and the vibrancy that's going on. So that experience as we, as we go through is also supporting about loads of festivals. It's not about the business improvement district sitting down and writing out a list of what it wants, wants to do. It's about listening carefully to all the great people across the city who are doing good things and supporting them. So the list of festivals you can see up here are all inspired by people elsewhere in the city. And they're coming to the business improvement district to say, we want to do this, we want to do more of this, that and the other. Can you help us, can you support us? And the answer to the vast majority is yes. We obviously have some criteria by which we have to assess things. We've got to go back to our electorate to say it's a good thing to do. But largely, we're supporting a large number of activities in the city that people come and visit and experience. And our third and last round, and I'll shut up, is the strong voice. So we know that we have some influence on the city, and if we work together, we can get things done. And we've also got to cast an eye to how we create businesses. How do we grow businesses in the city? The next Google could be right here in Norwich. Are we doing enough to make sure it could become that worldwide international company? Have we got the right infrastructure? Have we got the right skills here in the city? Do we know what we're going to do in the future to support businesses like that? And then at the other end, we've got long-established businesses in the city who've been here a long time. What's going, to, what's going to compel them to stay here? 
what's going to make them want to develop their business in Norwich? What can we do to support them and make sure they've got the right infrastructure and the right skills to thrive? So another very key part of what we do, as well as one of my favorites, is putting the Wi-Fi in. It's only my day job. Uh, telling people we put the free Wi-Fi into the city is a really big thing because they like to see what's actually physically happened. You're just sending out leaflets and telling people it's a great city. Well, no, we're not. We're doing some real physical stuff that's having a real impact on people in the city and businesses working within the city. And we know that because we have a lot of numbers. And putting facts behind your arguments is really powerful. Uh, we've done work in the past with the park and ride, and that's helped us go forward with the park and ride and how we use that. That's a simple example of how we've used it. We've also set up an elaborately named um, journey time monitor called Noggin. Uh, don't ask why, I'll explain later. But Noggin, again, looks at journey times for the city. So we've been working with the county council on how we, how we can manage some of the improvements to going in on the inner ring road. <coughs> when you put arguments aside with, you, with numbers, then you can actually demonstrate the impact you're having and it makes your argument so much more powerful. So the bid is all about creating that sort of information that helps the city make the right decisions. Okay. Right, thank you very much for, for listening to me. We're now onto the, uh, onto the entertaining side of the day. Please help us. Remember, 74% of people uh, who visit Norwich want to come back again. So if we can get all the people into the city, then we can suddenly make a difference and let them know what's going on. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, I hope it's a really entertaining morning. Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Um, <coughs> when I first came to Norwich, uh, somebody said to me, uh, the great thing about Norwich is that nobody passes through it on the way to anywhere. And then he said, if we could grass over the A11, we'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so things have changed, haven't they? Uh, now here we are wanting people to come and visit because it's a fabulous place. I came 35 years ago to present my first edition of Look East. And I promised myself I was staying for two years. So that's the effect that this place has on me. Our first speaker now is Vicky Parr, Business Support Manager from Visit England. Entertainment. <laughs> That's uh, uh, given, raised your expectations too high. Um, so, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the Norwich Bid for inviting Miss England to speak today. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to reach the businesses that uh, are representing the English and British tourism industry. So, uh, thank you for that. My talk covers a number of areas, uh, three main sections. One, uh, to start with a little bit of introduction about the organisation that I represent, then a little bit about the stats that we produce at a, at a national level, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the industrial strategy and the tourism sector deal, and then finally um, about some resources that we have available to you guys, completely free of charge, which you may or may not be aware of. So um, some real practical tips to help you hopefully improve and grow your business. Okay. <coughs> okay, so just to set, um, set the scene for the organisation uh, that I represent, there are two brands in existence, and sometimes there's a little bit of confusion as to what those two brands represent. In actual fact, the organisation is one, um, and we, uh, the, the two brands exist. And this is just really kind of to, to explain the difference between the two. So Britain is very much a marketing agency, first and foremost, to bring um, international visitors to the UK. So they work not only for the England brand, but also visit Wales, visit Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. So they have the remit predominantly for bringing in the international visitors into the country. And then Visit England is um, a, one of those four uh, domestic um, organisations and our remit is slightly different um, and it's more about focusing on the product that exists in England and making sure that that's world class, uh, that we develop and grow that business to make sure that uh, when people are coming to Britain that they predominantly stay in England. So that's, uh, that's our areas. 
And just to set the scene about where I particularly sit in the organisation, my remit is within Visit England. Um, a lot of our England team are shared between Visit Britain and Visit England. But the business support team, because of our role in developing uh, the businesses uh, of the English tourism product, uh, we are entirely funded by Visit England money. Some of you may know Ross if you've been involved with developing your business um, to make it more accessible. He's our accessibility champion and he's been with Visit England for over 10 years now, so he's quite a familiar face um, and often does talks like this. I joined the team only about 18 months ago, so I'm, I'm basically a new girl. So just to explain specifically what our team um, looks after. We have three main work streams um, and the one I am going to be talking about at the end of the talk is the Business Advice Hub. Um, but uh, I shall mention the Awards for Excellence and also the Accessible Tourism that we develop. And the Accessible Tourism is particularly uh, pertinent at the moment because it links very much in with the work that we've been doing on the tourism sector deal for the industrial strategy. So that, um, if we are successful in achieving that tourism sector deal, will become increasingly um, important to the work that we do um, in our department and also organisationally as well. So, the statistics. I think um, Caroline's going to talk a little bit more detail about the Norwich statistics specifically, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the national um, and regional. So, um, just to talk about um, overnight tourism, both inbound and domestic. I will start these presentations because they, they look a bit grim. Um, is that actually 2017 was a record year for both inbound and domestic tourism um, in, uh, in England. These statistics are England only. Um, so bear that in mind, and obviously our stats lag a little bit behind, but for, for 2018, the figures are down, but they're still the second highest figures in the last 10 years. So don't be too demoralised, they're still high positive figures. Um, in the east of England, as a region, in actual fact the figures aren't quite so good as the national figures. Um, and if I find a place on my page... Um, so the uh, inbound tourism was actually down 12% in volume and down 22% in spend. So actually not such a strong result from the East of England. And the domestic side, um, visits were down by 3% but spend grew by 1%. Um, so slightly different picture for the East of England. Um, but as I say, don't be too disheartened because 2017 was a real bumper year across the country. So this just demonstrates the growth of inbound tourism. I'll be talking a little bit about how some of our resources can help you tap into that market if that's an area that you would like to grow your business. But since the, the dip in the recession of 2008-2009, there has been, as I said, a steady and quite impressive growth for the last 10 years. Um, and as I say, 2017 was that bumpy year. So just having a look at the um, destinations of the international visitors that are coming to the east of England and also to England. France is our strongest market uh, from uh, international and also it is in the east of England as well, which is interesting. Sometimes when I'm presenting across the country, um, the destination is really varying. So that's quite, uh, quite interesting. You can see a little variation further down the table. Um, so if you're getting lots of visitors from those countries, then you're obviously tapping into uh, the right markets that are coming to the area. This is a really horrible slide, very busy. But it's quite interesting in that it breaks down the three areas of how we assess the stats. Uh, we have the pure holiday visits, uh, then visiting friends and relatives, and then the business market. And this slide again demonstrates this is domestic rather than inbound. Um, that growth in holiday visits, domestic overnight trips um, on the, in the holiday threshold has seen a nice steady healthy rise over the last 10 years. But actually visiting friends and relatives and the business tourism side of things has taken a very slight dip um, over that same time span. So quite different for the different types of visits. <coughs> 
If we're looking at um, accommodation for domestic overnights, this is quite interesting because that, not surprisingly, over a third of visitors prefer to stay in a, in a hotel or a motel style of accommodation. Um, but actually, what's quite interesting is the caravan and camping statistic, which is now um, over 10%, almost uh, uh, an eighth of, of visitors staying in hol on holiday uh, or staying overnight are going for caravan and camping. So it's a real um, growth area. And just to have a look at day trips, um, I picked up some uh, data on, uh, on, the, on, on Norwich. This is quite, these are nice figures, nice big chunky sums of money, always puts a smile on people's faces. Um, so I won't read these out, but as you can tell, large numbers equating to 126 million spend each year um, in Norwich. These are averaged out, so they, they take the, the three figures over three years and then average it out. Um, and 257,000 domestic holiday trips, so really positive. And I'm sure when anybody comes to Norwich, there was a picture of Norwich Castle, so I thought I should, I should do the same. Okay. If these stats are of interest to you, the Visit England, Visit Britain website is the same thing if you put in visitengland.org or visitbritain.org, you get to the same place. We have a huge amount of this kind of information on the website. So if you're putting in grant applications or you're doing business planning and you've got to um, demonstrate the, the value of tourism in the area, that's a really good place to pick up any stats. Um, and they're completely free and available and they're um, published and renewed on a regular basis. Um, so it's available to everybody, no, no hesitation there. Okay, so the industrial strategy, the slides um, I'm going to show, they're very detailed and I'm not going to go through them. I just want to give you sort of a summary of what the industrial <coughs> strategy is, what the tourism sector deal is, what it, what it could mean potentially for us. Unfortunately, this it's got caught up with something else that's going on in government at the time, I'm quite sure about this, but um, it's slowed down the process um, and we have actually been involved in um, the negotiations on this for um, over 18 months and we're still not quite at the end of the process, um, but uh, it's still looking very promising. So the industrial strategy is all about creating a sustainable industrial future for the country. And um, the, 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 I think it's a 10 year plan overall to actually bring the key industries round the table to discuss the future um, of how we can improve business, how we can develop it, and how we can sustain jobs for the future. Um, and so the government has created already sector deals with certain industries that they have identified, like the automotive industry, artificial intelligence, creative industries. They are already around the table. They've been selected by government. And what's now, what's since happened is they've identified that there are a few more spaces <coughs> at the table, and those, um, those, those are up for grabs, if you like. So this is where uh, Visit Britain stepped in. And uh, if, if, I, if I can put this in context, the automotive industry, I don't know exactly how many, but there's probably about six key players um, in, the, in the motor industry. So nice and easy to get those six to work together and create a, a united front for the, for, the, for the industrial strategy. Approximately in um, England, not the UK, but in England itself, there are over 200,000 tourism businesses. And therefore, it's not quite so easy for them to be represented in one, um, in one organisation. So Visit Britain took on that role to actually represent the industry to government to try and get a place at this industrial strategy table. Um, and as, I, as you can see, it's been started in 2017. Um, and this is how the process has, has developed. So there's lots of work went into this, lots of consultations, 
creating um, a set of ambitions, what it would mean in, in practicality about what the tourism sector deal could mean for the industry and what we would hope to. And it's a little bit of this, to be honest, because it's a, it's a new thing, it's an unknown quantity, but these are the sort of things that um, Visit Britain have been championing as part of the deal. And these um, represent the four pillars that the industrial strategy represents and what that means for, for our industry. One of the biggest challenges for our industry is about productivity. We have a real challenge because of the seasonality of tourism in our country. And actually, um, as an industry, our levels of productivity are not particularly strong because of that one main issue. So um, a lot of the discussions about productivity is, has been around about how to extend the season and make visits and destinations um, as much as all year round as we possibly can. Because it's not feasible for everybody, but trying to engender that kind of movement um, so that it's not just April to October. And so this is where we start talking about how we've, uh, how we've progressed. Um, I think it was November, at the end of November last year, we had some great news, the first sort of positive step since we put the proposal to government, that they were keen to have further negotiations with us on a tourism sector deal. So this was very much an amber light um, that they were, they were you know, keen on what we were doing. Um, and we are hopeful that very soon, probably not in the next couple of weeks in reality, um, there will be some decisions on whether we have been successful in achieving that tourism sector deal. I think the, the team that are working on this were hopeful that it was going to happen this week during English Tourism Week, but unfortunately um, that's not going to be the case as far as I'm aware. Um, so that's about the tourism sector deal. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions um, in the panel if you do have any, um, but I'll, I'll move on to the next bit. Um, so this is about what we can offer you as businesses. And some of you may be aware of, of the Hub, but we're very conscious that uh, although it was launched originally about three or four years ago, um, it's kind of been hiding its light under a bushel um, and it's been hidden away on the, uh, on the Visit England and the Visit Britain websites. But basically, uh, October last year, we relaunched the Hub, had it repositioned on the Visit England, Visit Britain websites, so it's much easier to find, much easier to navigate. We've added a series of resources and I'll uh, go through those in a moment, give you a bit more detail about those. Um, and the idea is that the, trying to find business support resources is a real minefield. The, the landscape of finding that information is really challenging. And we wanted to try and make this hub a one-stop shop. We don't own all of the resources or of the materials that we refer to. Sometimes we refer to um, uh, the government websites, HRC, um, and the such like, because they have better information than we do. As you can see in our team, there's only three of us. So we're not in a position to write and curate anything. So we've, we've done a lot of work in trying to find the best places, the best information, um, and, and actually signpost off. So we're not about spending hours and hours on our website. We're actually really keen if you find a link to another website and go off and find that information. And the links we have take you direct to those resources. We don't just drop you off at the home page and let you find your way through. It's very much about taking you straight to the, to the door of these, uh, these resources. This will tell you a little bit more than I can. English tourism businesses come in many different shapes and sizes, but there's one place you can find advice and support to help your business grow. Visit England's Business Advice Hub. It has free and easy to navigate advice on all the key business areas. If your business is in its early stages, we have tools and resources to help you understand your market better and find potential sources of funding to start or grow your business. Wherever you're based in England, you can connect to local support experts and strengthen your network. If you want to take on your first employee or expand your team, we have step-by-step -step guides to recruitment, apprenticeships and employee management. 
You'll find information to help you be legally compliant, including the fire risk assessment tool, guidance on alcohol and entertainment licensing, and the latest on food labeling and allergies. You can also buy your own copy of the Visit England Pink Book. If you're ready to grow your business, we have tools to help make it more accessible. We provide practical tips on improving accessibility through a range of guides and help you produce an accessibility guide. Start your journey towards Visit England recognition with the official star rating and quality schemes. We can help you market your business too with our digital marketing toolkit and opportunities to boost your international presence with our inbound tourism toolkit. We'll guide you through entering the Visit England Awards for Excellence for a chance to win national recognition. So whatever your tourism business, the Visit England Business Advice Hub is dedicated to helping you grow. Okay, so um, it's mentioned a couple of times, but I really want to stress that it is completely free. There's no, no strings attached. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to be a member of the quality schemes or anything like that. It's completely open. There's no firewall or, or signing process at all. We don't capture your information. Um, uh, there's only one, one area that we do that. So these are the, the category headings, and hopefully the video just gives you a little flavour of, uh, of the kind of resources that are available out there. Um, I've mentioned about inbound tourism, and this is um, one of our latest toolkits, and I have um, a hard copy here, a nice bit of bedtime reading if anybody's interested. Um, I've got a little table at the back um, which has some uh, leaflets and uh, uh, some of the, the hard copy resources that we have. So um, in the breaks, do help yourself to anything that's on there. Um, this topic was produced um, predominantly uh, on the back of the Discovering Me Fund projects, which was a fund which we're sort of coming to the end of now, which is a three-year project where we had uh, £43 million to give away to projects and products across England to help grow new um, products and experiences that would be of interest to the international market. But in the process of doing that, we realised that there was a, a sort of a, an education gap and that a lot of these businesses were quite small, quite new perhaps to the industry, and although doing great things, didn't have a great awareness of how to get their product to the international market. So this toolkit was produced uh, and it is really useful. I've been in tourism a number of years and, and we were able to proofread this before it went out and it is actually really interesting. So um, my top tip for today is that that is downloaded, downloadable from the um, hub, but you can also order a hard copy completely free of charge. That's where you will have to enter your address details. Obviously it's a bit difficult to see without that. Um, and that will help for the phase two part of this project, which is about a training, which will go alongside this guide. And the training is uh, being sorted out at the moment. We're hoping it's going to roll out in the next couple of months. And one of the ways that they're going to, we're going to identify where, the, where we start the training is where we've had critical mass of people requesting the hard copy of the book. So if you would like that training to come to Norwich and the East of England, then order your hard copy on the internet and then we'll know that there's an appetite in this area to bring, uh, to bring the training to this area. I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but it will certainly help inform the, the process. So the training is, uh, is detailed there, and uh, as I said, I've got a copy if you want to have a look at the, at the detail that's in there. So things like this, this is a toolkit that has, <coughs> is a, a longest standing toolkit, it's been around um, since, uh, well just after the, the uh, legal assignment, so about 2006 I think it was launched, and over that time we've had over 18,000 fire risk assessments created by this tool. This is specifically for the accommodation sector, so it's a legal requirement if you're in the accommodation sector. So if, uh, if you haven't got one of these, you're new to the um, new to accommodation sector, then have a look at that. Again, completely free, just creates a Word document, you can pop it on your website 
um, and you're legally compliant. The pink book was mentioned in the video. Um, <coughs> I have to say I'm a little bit out of date because the 10th edition we, we received um, today, uh, this week actually. So that again is a very long standing um, resource and a lot of people have found the advice hub because they've been searching for details on the pink book. It's basically, again, predominantly for accommodation providers, but useful to any tourism business. Uh, it's all the legal, regulatory compliance elements relevant for tourism uh, or accommodation providers in England in one neat little book. We've actually had solicitors come to us and buy copies because they find it really useful to, to help with their clients that come from the tourism industry. Uh, as I say, we launched um, the 10th edition, arrived in our office this week. Uh, there is a cost to buy the hard copy, but you, all the information within it um, is on the, on the hub. Um, and uh, the online version is updated every couple of months, and the book is produced every two years. Accessibility, I mentioned um, this early on in the presentation. I've got a few of these guides on the table over there. This is a massive area of work for, for us, um, and there's still plenty of work to be done. Um, we, as you can see on the, on the left-hand side, there's a logo there for the Visit England Awards. We have uh, one of our categories. It's all about celebrating the best uh, businesses that um, provide accessibility for all at their businesses. So we really try and recognise the best in the country with regard to making businesses, experiences, stays, travel as accessible as possible. And it's an increasing market. It's not just about those in wheelchairs. It's those with uh, learning difficulties, mums with push chairs, uh, the older generation who have um, decreasing mobility uh, and other impairments. So it's much wider than just um, thinking about those that need access via wheelchairs. Accessibility guides is part of that. Again, um, we encourage the use of ac uh, accessibility information on websites for all tourism businesses, so whether you're a visitor attraction, provider tour and experience, or an accommodation provider, actually publish what you can accommodate, even if there are restrictions, or even if your business is, is completely accessible to all. Having that information is valuable. Again, a free toolkit works your, work, works your way through that information. Quality assessment is one of the things you might know us best for in the past is our star rating scheme. Still very much active, still very much involved. <coughs> Some people aren't aware that we actually do schemes outside of accommodation. So we actually have quality assurance schemes for passenger boats, for visitor attractions, for race courses. Uh, and motorway service areas, not a great um, need in Norwich for those, but um, they are still in existence and all the information is available on the hub on those. Digital Marketing Toolkit was mentioned in the video, again quite recent, this was produced June last year and we ha are uh, having an annual update of this. We had an online marketing toolkit produced about two or three years ago and were not unsurprised, I guess, by how quickly it became out of date. So with this one, again, completely downloadable um, and uh, will be updated later this year. We also have this um, local support finder. One, some of the feedback we got when doing some research was that we can only offer sort of national level support, but actually people often want to find support from their local organisations and they don't know where to start. So we've created a local support finder that actually surfaces the destination organisations. And I, as you can see, I did a, um, a search for Norfolk and Visit Norwich um, came up and a few others as well. Um, but also the local, um, the LEMP Growth Hub as well, which will offer business support to any types of business um, and will uh, help tourism businesses as well. So uh, you can, uh, if you have businesses outside of uh, Norfolk, you can put in the county that you operate in and it will come, come up with those organisations.
actually in the heart of English Tourism Week. It ran from Saturday to this coming Sunday. And we run this campaign every uh, year. It's usually a fortnight before the Easter holiday kicks in. And it's an unashamed marketing plug to get uh, domestic tourism into the newspapers in the lead up to the Easter holidays. Um, and I know that today's event was placed in this week to, to enable, um, enable the, the sort of social media and the promotion that runs alongside this campaign. So hopefully, <coughs> not a lot we can do for this year, but hopefully next year, the idea is that businesses at a local level do something a bit quirky, a bit newsworthy, that gets into the local papers, into the local media, um, and then it gets um, forwarded, use the hashtag, it gets raised up to a national level, and we can promote it and creating news stories. Um, it's, um, this, as it says on the video, toolkits and ideas are the sort of things you can do. So hopefully think about it for um, to February, March next year, plan something that you think will perhaps be of interest to the local media um, and raise the profile of Norwich during the English Tourism Week. Okay, I'll just talk briefly about the awards. Um, We've, um, the, we run the Visit England Awards for Excellence, which is, we uh, like to call Tourism Oscars, although officially not allowed to call it that. Um, and um, we've just gone through a very big consultation process and revamping of the awards. Um, and this has changed how we uh, align our competition with the local competitions across the country. Um, I won't go into too much detail now because it's quite complex what we've gone through, but effectively now we have made the landscape, if you like, much easier for businesses to apply. There's a standard set of uh, categories, standard set of questions, all of which up until this point had been varied and um, so it wasn't a particular level playing field. Um, at the moment, in, the, uh, in this area, we are negotiating um, with the Visit East of England, um, or East Anglia, uh, to, to maybe create a competition for this whole region. We don't have one at the moment, so we're very much looking at that. Um, and then that would mean that businesses from Norwich could apply to that regional competition, and then if their winners would work their way up to a national level. So it's very exciting. Um, uh, and just so you can see, we, we are always working 18 months ahead because obviously all the, the local competitions have to take place before we can feed their winners into our competition. So under this new format, our first event, our actual awards presentation, won't be until June next year. Um, so, we're, so that's how, we're, um, how, how it will take shape. So just to finish off, um, if, uh, if you want to access the hub, uh, that's the top uh, URL, just visit england.org or visit britain.org forward slash business advice. And we also have a fortnightly business to business newsletter, which uh, is really useful if you just want to keep up to date on updates nationally, updates uh, about what's going on in government with regard to tourism, what's happening with the events that we are uh, working on. Um, and I have a little box um, on the table, so if you just want to drop your business card into that box, I'll send you an email after today with a link direct to sign up. I can't sign up on your behalf because of GDPR, but I can send you the link for you to do that yourselves. So thank you very much, and I really hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much indeed. I particularly enjoyed the overnight tourism graph, which uh, looked a bit like Bridget Riley's works of art. Um, we're now coming down to a local level, so Head of Marketing for Norwich Bid, please welcome Caroline Mears. Thank you everybody for coming today. Um, so as the slide says, I'm, I'm Head of Marketing at the Norwich Business Improvement District, which also includes um, Visit Norwich. 
It's a really exciting time for Norwich, and I'm very pleased to be able to share some of our plans with you today. But first, here we go. So putting Norwich on the map, this is why we're here, and this is what we're aiming to do. Um, but first, I wanted to highlight a few words. So welcoming, friendly, historic, unconventional, independent spirit, characterful, creative, beautiful, maverick. So these are words that we have captured that people who know Norwich describe the city as such. But what we found is that people who do not live here or know Norwich, they don't have that narrative. They're not sure how to describe the city. So this is something we really wanted to explore because Norwich is really unique, as we know. It's amazing and it has unique experiences for everybody. So just a few highlights. We were named England's first UNESCO City of Literature. We hold purple flag status, so it's like blue flag status for beaches. We're one of the safest nighttime economies in the country. Uh, we have independent shopping at its best, from Gerald's Independence Store to the Lanes, which won the British High Street of the Year in 2014. We've recently um, joined the Global Alliance to become the UK's first sharing city, so celebrating all good things that can come with the sharing economy. And recently, our market won the great, um, the best UK outdoor market in the UK. Um, we have the most complete medieval street map with beautiful architecture. Culture abound, from the theatres to the galleries, the Sainsbury Centre, and of course the highlight of the year is the Northern Norwich Festival, soon to launch on the 10th of May. A slight plug here, so we're involved in helping to put on the opening night, which will be a fantastic tightrope walk across the city centre, so please come along, free for all. And the city hosts spectacles, such as the Hands of Skelter that's coming to the Norwich Cathedral, which will be quite something to see. So as you can tell, we have amazing things to um, offer and to share. And Norwich does have a thriving tourist economy. Um, so thank you to Vicky for sharing the inbound and the domestic sort of overview. I just wanted to bring it a bit closer into Norwich. Um, so tourism here is worth £752 million a year to the local economy. And that includes 476 million of total day trips. That's 96% of our visitors come for day trips. So we can definitely explore and increase overnight stays and staying for longer. We currently rank 29th when it comes to a UK destination for leisure breaks. Again, I think there's room for improvement there. Um, so we host 12.3 million, I mean the numbers are mind-boggling, um, total trips of people coming to stay. Those that do stay overnight stay on average about 3.3 nights. I don't know where the point three comes from, but obviously averaged out. Um, but in terms of the sector, so we account for 25% of employment in the city. And that equates to 13,178 roles and jobs um, that support tourism-related activities. So incredibly important to the city. Um, but there is room to improve. And we want to embrace new channels and new ways of promoting the city. We recently had a lot of success with, working with Visit England on the Instameet on the 23rd of March, where we hosted 40 Instagrammers with Igers. Um, so thank you to Paul Dixon, uh, the Cathedral and the Norwich Market, where we really showcased Norwich to the world, really celebrating English Tourism Week. Um, you can see this all with the hashtag MyMicroGap. So it's working with Visit England to celebrate what's on our doorstep, to try something new, to explore a city in a new way. Um, and also hashtag City of Stories, which is the one that we use and are going to use so much more. Um, so it just shows the city in a new light and this is something we're going to explore. So putting Nor Norwich on the map now is the right time. We have all the right people around the table. Um, so at Norwich Bid, our board is supported by 19 local businesses, including city and county council. We have theatres, retailers, um, the airport and transport. So everyone is around the table um, with a shared ambition of raising the profile of the city. Um, and in our capacity, as Norwich Bid, we look at three key work streams. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, we're all about having a clear and um, positive impact on the vitality of the city and all the businesses that are within it. So I lead on the promoting work stream, which is primarily 
the tourism play. Um, but actually what that includes is later on in the year we're going to be doing a commercial campaign to really celebrate Norwich as a place to, to grow and encourage a business to thrive, which does already happen, but there's opportunities for more. And our colleagues uh, look after the Norwich experience. So again, with our wonderful host, the purple flag status, the head on the home, the Christmas lights, the projector, the list goes on, and stronger voice. Um, but there's so much more coming up to celebrate. So 2020, I know it's next year, but there's some fantastic things coming up to look forward to. We're part of leading a feasibility study to introduce a new light festival into the city what the top left is meant to represent, um, in February. So working title, Love Light, but that involves um, artists with fire, art installations in unexpected places. So that could be a real amazing event for the calendar. Of course, we've got the Castle Keep renovations. The millions of pounds invested in that will start to be unveiled in 2020. Next year, um, the MA Creative Writing at the UEA celebrates 50 years. The Norwich University for Arts are 175 years old. We've got Dippy the Dinosaur completing his tour of the UK in the cathedral. Um, Norfolk Norwich Festival starts to celebrate 250 years um, of being around, um, and that completes in 2023. And Gerald are 250 years old, so something to celebrate there. And what if, what if we got the premiership for the Norwich City Football Club? That could be a game changer. <laughs> So this year, it's all about getting our house in order, but in the best possible way. And not only that, we're involved in a project looking even further away, so 2040. Um, so led by City Council, this started in 2017, to really engage with communities, businesses, citizens, to really state their vision for the city. And what do everyone want? What do people want? And um, what's arrived out of that are five key pillars. So people are looking for and really desire a celebration of the creative city, a livable city, a fair city, um, a connected one, and a dynamic city. And one of the first things that people want us to do is to really promote Norwich to the outside world. So that's what we're going to do. So how are we going to do this? So I've been in post nine months. I'm a relative newbie. Um, but one of the first things we wanted to do is just really explore who else has done this fantastically well. And we wanted to think big, so we looked at countries, as well as really leading cities across the world. Um, so just a few highlights of things that have really informed our brand plan as we go through. So Wales saw a £350 million uplift in tourism spend as a result of doing the rebrand. And when the local government embraced that brand, they saw a 16% uplift in GPs wanting to train and live in Wales. They also saw a 60% increase in visitors to the Trade and Invest Conference in 2017. One that's incredibly iconic is the iHeart New York. So this was designed over 40 years ago by Milton Glaser, and it was designed to animate an idea from Mary Wells Lawrence about capturing the spirit of the place. And this is what we want to do with Norwich. It was created as a campaign to promote New York State and the design radiated love and positivity at a time when the area was best known for crime. And we don't have such a problem, but there's something very inspiring about a very simple mark. It was modern, it was simple, it was inclusive, it projected warmth, fun and friendliness. And people have made it their own. I've still got a key room from 20 years ago. Melbourne. They've recently created quite a dynamic mark, and that's all about celebrating diversity, and it's always changing. So there's a story to tell. Branding these days is so much more than a veneer. It's all about every interaction you might have with that place. One of my favourites that we looked at was the Swedish number. So Sweden itself doesn't necessarily have lots of iconic, iconic landmarks to visit, but they have passionate and warm people. So what they did is they set up a dedicated phone number where anyone in the world could phone and speak to a random Swede. Which is just game changing. So you have 85,000 random Swedes answering 200,000 calls over four months. It was just incredible. And apparently there was a marriage as a result, so I love that. Um, we are particularly inspired by Eindhoven in the Netherlands, and they have done something absolutely game changing where they've collaborated with businesses and organisations and created open access artwork. So it's not who is it for one organisation to own a city, it's open to everybody. So therefore, you get artists interpreting the mark. 
you get the risk of putting that on the coffee. So that's something we were really inspired by. And also Helsinki have done a fantastic job at creating quite a vibrant palette, which is a very ambitious state of play for the future of it. Um, and it's all about driving consistency with a flexible mark that can work across all their channels. So we scooped up all this research and we have informed our own plan. And it was quite timely, the October-November time, uh, Mark Tungate wrote in the place marketing issue of Creative Review, there's rarely a creative idea in the tourism sector. There's a lot of vanilla out there, but it doesn't have to be that way. And that's what we saw from all of these examples. There's so much more that we can do. <laughs> so that was kind of the big brand thinking. And closer to home, we really wanted to understand what do people think of Norwich? What are we known for? What are the opinions? What are the perceptions? So we ran two, we ran two key studies. So one with Ipsos Mori. So we questioned 2,000 people across the UK, what they thought of Norwich, were they aware, um, what their brand perceptions, what comes to mind, and then we dug a bit deeper, and I'll come on to that in a sec, with some mobile ethnography, a new innovative technique to actually get video and film from people as they discover more about this. But we orientated it all around you know, the fantastic resources that are available freely on Visit England and Visit Britain's website. Uh, they've invested in domestic tourism segmentation, so we thought, why, why reinvent the wheel and how can we make that work for us? So three of the segments that really struck a chord with who we see as visitors and who we want to encourage more of. Free and easy mini breakers, so that's your young professionals looking for cultural experiences. Country living traditionalists, so newly retired but like finer things. And aspirational family fun, so something for everyone. And the other ones are more coastal based, but we do see ourselves as the gateway to Norfolk. Um, but these are our absolute focus audience. So mobile ethnography, we do have limited budget, so we wanted to stretch it and try something new. Um, so what we did, we worked with Atticus Research, and we built this fantastic tool in, in Dino, where people during the course of a week are asked to to speak and share their opinions about things, and if they don't know Norwich, they kind of go on a journey of discovery, and boy, do they go on a journey of discovery. But what's fantastic is they came out of it wanting to come here, and we are going to invite them. <laughs> so what we learned, what we learned is that there's a real opportunity to put Norwich on the map. Um, as the Brits love our weekend breaks, 81%, so four out of five of us do them every year. However, most people who come to Norwich already have a connection. So whether that be work, family or friends, and 32% of those questions struggled to put Norwich on the map, which really surprised me. Um, and only 14% of those holidayed in, um, that took a city break came to Norwich. However, as Andrew said, once you come, you really love it. The city delivers, so we've got an average score of 7.3 out of 10 and three quarters wanted to come back. What do visitors want then? Well, when you look at the collective, what people are looking for from a UK destination, and then you look at what Norwich has to offer, we tick a lot of boxes. So they want a break from everyday life, new places to see, new discoveries, a low cost and low risk, especially now with all the uncertainty, and the UK really delivers that as a place to um, experience a break and find something new. They want hidden gems, something to discover, and social currency we're seeing as a real trend. So that's born out of people almost building their personalities online, dare I say. Um, but people are looking for more than just a price. They want to have achievements. They want to um, experience things and share that with the ones that they love. And local culture is really interesting because not only do they want to go to the sites that are promoted frequently, but live like a local. So that means that with new technologies, we can really lift the, the bonnet as to how it works within Norwich and showcase what we can offer. Easy to reach came out as a really key thing. So there's a magic two hour travel time. So that's kind of where we're orientating the focus. And that's the two hour travel time for a weekend break, then you can spend most of your time enjoying your weekend. Of course, quality food and drink and then authentic experiences. So the real place, so nothing like a veneer or a fake. So as you can tell, in the course of a few months, we've done quite a lot of digging and research, but it's no long enough to just speak to an audience and say, this is our story. We have to speak with them. So we're going to be doing things a little bit different for Norwich. 
but it also means that we can be quite smart with how we spend our money. So shared ownership from the examples I shared earlier was a real light bulb moment. So our residents, people who live here, are our brand ambassadors. We'll tell the stories of real people who own the city so our visitors will feel, feel that they can belong to. Authenticity. So we want to be an enabler to share an authentic voice with the city, articulating what's already here. We don't have to pre pretend to be something we're not. Who we are and what we aspire to. So our content will inspire human feelings because I'll come on to it in a bit, but what we've learned is no longer do facts and figures do the job alone. And a real sense of pride. So when our citizens are proud, visitors are encouraged to find out more and see what all the fuss is about. And finally, participation. So we want to be just as much about curation as we are creation of content and storytelling, as told by residents and visitors. And it's a two-way conversation that will encourage that participation. So we are going to do things differently, and we want to be innovative when it comes to tourism marketing. And this is all born out of the insight that we saw that choosing a city is incredibly influenced by this blend of rational and emotional needs that somebody has. These are the top ones that came out um, for when it is choosing a UK break. So how far is it? How easy is it to travel? What's it going to cost me? How do I get around? Is it safe? Okay, I've got hygiene factors. How will it make me feel? Is there something to explore? Are there historical buildings, attractions? Is it walkable? We have one of the most walkable cities in the UK. Is it friendly? What's the culture like? Are there inspiring places to stay? We have all of these ingredients. We just need a better narrative to be able to hook people in and get them really interested. Visitors want that hook. So where you have Bath with the Roman baths, Cornwall with the beaches, what's the thing for Norwich? So, we do have a plan, we are pleased to know. Um, and that is, starting from a business perspective, we think that we can make Norwich a top 20 destination in 2020. And this is born out of a number of things. So, audience insight, we know that the love of the city needs to start long before someone journeys here. They need to feel inspired and that time spent in Norwich is going to be time well spent. Universally, we know that historically we've put listings and what's on, and that's our most used part of the website. But that would play second fiddle, and it would be more so as to how a place makes you feel. So we want to um, encourage conversation by people getting involved. We are truly a city of firsts, steeped in history, an independent community with a progressive cultural scene, and a maverick spirit that reflects where we are. And yes, you do have to come here, but there's so many reasons why you should come here, and this is what we should celebrate. But what we're pushing against, people don't know what Norwich stands for, uh, what it feels like, what it offers, and where it's even on the map. So, what we're going to do is encourage that shared ownership, encourage authentic stories to be shared, and pride and participation. And the platform we're going to evolve is Norwich, the city of stories. It was university loved with all of our research that we've done. We've already got it in the fabric of the city with our urban art, so it's only something that we can build upon. It's just not had time to live and breathe. We are in the midst of a rollout. There are things coming up. I'm going to share with you a little taster of what to expect. But timing wise, let me just do. Okay. So, at this point, I just want to share the narrative about what we mean by Norwich the City of Stories and why it's so ownable for the city. We did a creative tender at the back end of last year and we're working with Arc and Graphic Language because words are going to be just as important as the visual identity. And it's how we kind of build that whole personality for the city. So I'll just read you as to a little bit of a pitch for why Norwich is a city of stories. Always moving, always innovating, always growing, and always with a story to tell. Norwich is a progressive, dynamic city that's unafraid to lead the way or to change with the times. Named UNESCO's first, um, sorry, named England's first UNESCO city of literature, Norwich pioneered the first MA in creative writing course and is the home to the National Centre for Writing. Yet our stories 
reach beyond just the literary. And that's what we're going to start animating. Hashtag City of Stories. What we're going to share today is that there will be a dedicated launch day for all of this with the Brian Wilde Memorial on the 7th of May. We've got a window um, before we go into the summer season. We distribute the new printed map, which will be available from the 13th of May. Um, we're going to be sharing our brand guidelines and a toolkit with the key messages to help every business promote Norwich as a place to thrive. Um, we're reskilling our website. We are doing a website tender. There'll be a new looking for your website from September, so it's really future proof and mobile first. Um, <coughs> the beauty of the fact that this all sits within the bid is that we can update the city hosts' uniform, what they wear, the city map, and how it all links together with the new wayfinding and signage. Um, in June, it'll be one of our first big pushes for seasonal campaigns, so we're going to be investing in spring, summer, autumn, winter beyond and, and obviously nationally and eventually internationally and that's where digital assets will be incredibly important to spread our story far and wide. We need to grab people's hearts and minds and therefore we're going to be piloting a podcast and also looking at potentially a brand film but this makes it incredibly shareable and easy to expand our reach. Um, and then um, we get into getting, therefore if we establish all of our key touch points, come 2020 in the pre-promotion we've got our house in order. And then there's a really compelling suite of why people should come here. And at this point, I think a video can do better than I can to animate something. celebrating the city of stories um, and we want to know your Norwich story so we'd love you to use this to tell us your favourite characters, places, histories or happenings now that must be seen and that cannot be missed um, so please do contribute, leave your card and if you want to talk with us more leave your details, it's all GDPR so tick the box if you're happy for us to contact you but you'll start to see these shared stories of Norwich um, and also um, how we can enable this digitally there will be, there is a new branding, there is a new mark, but we just didn't want to cram it into a very rich packed agenda today. So look out on the 7th of May and I hope you can get involved. So whether you're coming here for a day, a weekend or a lifetime, as many people tend to do, we know that everyone's got a story of Norwich, so please do share yours and I can't wait to read them. Thank you. as well, thank you very much. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm going to go and phone a Swede later. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, what we're going to do now is have the first of our panel discussions. So I'm going to ask Caroline and Vicky to come back up. We'll switch on the microphone for this bit. I'm also going to get Martin Brendel from Norfolk Outdoor Adventures to come up. And um, actually, just while you're sitting down, just give me 30. No, let's sit up here. Um, Give me 30 seconds on what what you do and what. Yeah. Right. Hi, everybody. I'm Martin. Uh, I own uh, Norfolk Outdoor Adventures, which is a, quite a new venture out on the Norfolk Broad, set up a couple of years ago. Um, I specialise in taking people out on the Norfolk Broads in kayaks and stand up paddle boards. And, um, and what I discovered, um, I did a little bit of work with uh, uh, Sport England, with the RSPB, and I, I discovered that um, people did not use their local environment. They didn't know what was on their doorstep. So I discovered that there's a you know, high percentage of people who don't use their national park. Um, and when they did use it, they didn't know where to go or what to do, or they didn't know anything about the nature, the fauna and flora. So I set up a business um, that took people, that guided them, took hold of their hand, 
took them out into nature um, and um, really immersed them in their local environment and educated them at the same time. So um, there's a whole host of assets to why I did this, from the, the educational, the physical, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But um, basically, people, didn't, pe people who live in the Broads National Park don't get out into it. And it was part of my sort of personal crusade is to get people out and get spiders in their face and uh, you know and, uh, and really sort of immerse them in their local environment so um, yeah it's, it's a very sort of physical immersive um, experience that we've set up. Good thank you you were doing very well till the spiders came up and then I saw a couple of faces. <laughs> <laughs> um, very small spiders. <laughs> just if you've got a question can you just stick your hand up and I'll get to you and bring a microphone to you or, or you can shout and do whatever you want to do. Right, okay, we'll start with that because I'd rather have a proper one, yeah. Hi. Uh, head of communications, firstly, first of all, the left. Um, maybe a one for a few, Vicky and Caroline. So which market are we tapping into mostly or trying to get to Norwich? So, which geographical area, actually? Good question. Who wants to take that? Go on, yep. It's probably all for me. Um, I think the key insight is the two hour travel time. Um, and because we are primarily a day trip destination, but we are going to explore extending that state because so much people can do here. It's kind of, it's the Midlands, it's London, and I think the Norwich in 90, when the rolling stop starts going out with the trains from May, that's going to be a game changer from a tourism point of view. Um, so it's, it's primary, but we see a lot from um, Edinburgh as well, so we, with the airport. And then we've also got the connections with Northern Europe. So I think we're focusing primarily on the UK with the two-hour travel time, but we will eventually go international. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. It's just, um, uh, Caroline mentioned something called uh, micro-gapping, uh, which is a campaign that uh, Visit England and Visit Britain have been promoting for about six or nine months, I suppose, and that is particularly targeting the 18 to 34 age group and the idea of micro-gapping is to have a similar kind of educational uh, and fun experience that you might get in a gap year in a mini break. So it's all about experiences, um, travelling somewhere in the UK, um, ideally England from our perspective, um, and engaging with that age group who traditionally are all about um, social media and about um, sharing their experiences with their friends. Um, and generally, the research showed that they don't really engage with holiday in, in the UK. So it was a real initiative to try and show the fabulous experiences that they can have on the doorstep without traveling overseas. So that is a, a sort of more kind of market specific rather than geography, but that campaign um, has been going for a few months. It's quite been, been that's, quite that's They're part of your target audience as well, aren't they? And what, what's, what's the reception like? Where you are. Yeah, well, I mean, for, for me, it's been really interesting because I'm, you know, Norfolk Outdoor was selected as part of the English National Parks collection, which we're, you know, very, very fortunate to be a part of. And the main focus of that was to promote um, experiences and bo bookable experiences in particular to the Australian and the German markets. Um, research from, um, I think it was uh, the Visit England um, uh, <coughs> thing that we were, uh, that we were involved in. Um, it showed that um, an awful lot of people from these countries, from uh, Germany and from Australia, loved to come to the UK, but they really weren't big fans of going to big major cities like London and Manchester. They actually wanted to come and visit the, the places where people lived and worked, um, and hence Norwich and the East of England was a real, real big part of that. And so these, these are people that, ex, that know about um, smaller cities, because they've got an awful lot of smaller cities, they've got the big cities as well, but they've also got the national parks. Norwich falls within a national park. So these are the, the people that love to travel to visit the national parks, to see real people living and working in the landscape. So, and actually since that, I've actually seen a little bit of uptake in um, certainly uh, European um, inquiries um, from the British national parks. So, yeah, so we've had a... Good. Yeah. Caroline, what makes you think City of Stories will actually bring anybody in? 
putting a lot of bets on it. Um, I think it's all born out of insight. It's the fact that what is the hope that we can have and how can we present ourselves to the world in a very consistent way? As you saw at the beginning and also around the room, we've got many logos, many brands, so we're bringing it all under one family and we're being very confident about saying we are a city of stories. We can absolutely own that with our heritage and link to the literary world, but it's a great flexible platform to then springboard into lots of stories across food and drink, attractions, outdoor adventures. Um, so it's an encapsulating simple message that will hopefully inspire people as to what they can achieve in Norwich. Good, okay. Um, can I, as somebody who moved to Norwich a long time ago, I know, but the, whenever I have people come to stay, they always say, fine. Who thinks that fine is a good way to represent Norwich? <laughs> is it? It's a fabulous city. It's fabulous, but fine. I'm not allowed to call anything fine. It is, it is fabulous, and fine is a dividing word. And some people love it, born out of a refined city of old. Um, and that will still remain in the hearts and minds of many people, um, but it doesn't connect with younger audiences. No, that's um, right. So we need to create meaning for what we can do. Okay, and the other questions about what we're doing here. What about transport? I mean, the, the, it, we're going to come on to transport a little bit later. Uh, you're saying Norwich is 90, but that's going to be a couple of trains a day during the week, isn't it? But if we think about the primary audience, tourism, that's fine. You can book in advance, you can get a great deal, and it makes it very accessible for London. I mean, I lived and worked in London, and it takes an hour to get anywhere anyway. Um, so it just opens up those doors. Just takes you an hour to park in Norwich. Exactly. Um. <laughs> <laughs> park and ride, park and ride. <laughs> it stops at the uh, Do you want to say anything about, uh, about transportation and how important that is? Um, well, the, uh, the, the two sides of accessibility that I talked about with regard to the tourism sector deal, obviously one is, the, is, is making the uh, uh, venues and, and facilities accessible for all, but also the other side of accessibility is how the visitors get to and around the country. And Visit England do partner with um, a lot of the... Um, Airports, airlines, um, the rail companies, there is constant dialogue and that is part of the tourism strategy, um, sorry, the tourism sector deal to make sure that we're not just talking about the, 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 the actual experience in the destinations but actually how visitors, both domestic and inbound, get here and get around. So no specific messages I can give you, but it is all part of that wider work that we're doing to try and get that seat at the government's table. Why do we have so many people from Poland coming here? Mm. <laughs> it was on your graph. <laughs> I think um, it's part Does anybody know the answer to that? <laughs> I think partly it's to do with perhaps the, the residents here and, and visiting friends and relatives that are uh, living here. Um, and... Um, Sometimes people ask, you know, what, what should I translate my website into or what should I translate my visitor information into? And there's no hard and fast rules. It depends which um, nationalities are visiting your area or living in your area because those that are living in your area are also likely to be visiting your tourism um, uh, facilities as well. So I think that, that anecdotally, I would say that's probably can I just have a little show of hands? How many of you think that you use um, social media well? <laughs> Come on, put them right up if you do. No, you do. And how many of you think that you don't? <laughs> right. <laughs> Why not? Why don't? What What could you do more of? Do you think? Yeah, yes. I think this is a book. And, but, but actually, what we heard from Caroline, it's very important. We've had these, uh, what were they called? The vloggers here. Were, the the Instagrammers are on Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag and actually, is the way forward. Yes. And does that work? Yes, because it opens it up globally. Um, and especially if we're working in collaboration with Visit England, it gives us a national and international platform. So they share, they were briefed, in Mel worked incredibly hard briefing all the Instagrams before they even came here to say what to expect, there's an itinerary for the day, and please could you, as part of this kind of working together and collaborating, share these 
shared hashtag. So the fact that we are aligned with Visit England using Norwich and City of Stories, it gave us such an international platform. And do you, are those people who, are, who use social media, do you put something new on every day? Yeah. Lots of nodding. Some Depends. people very, very irregularly. Oh, is that important with vlogging? I'm not. Is it? What, what sort of things do you put on there? That, that Norwich has to offer, things like the market and the food, which, that, I mean, the market, it used to be just be hoover bags and um, <laughs> the old flower store. But yeah. now, I mean, you can eat from around the world on Norwich Market. Can't buy a hoover bag. Hoover bag, right? Yeah, you can buy anything, any vacuum ever. <laughs> yeah, it is important what we, what we have to offer there. And I think there's a part of element of surprise when people come here um, and they go, I just didn't realise that all of this was available. And I suppose the other audience we're really targeting are people that live here to really try something new, to go to the market, to experience the street food. So part of our marketing campaign is going to be engaging with everyone who lives here to get involved and to try things out. Just, uh, just going on to what I was talking about earlier, um, the statistic that from 2017 is that from people that live in Norwich and the immediate surrounding area of Norwich, 76% of those people don't use the area. So that's a massive, massive, you know, people don't use the, the, the facilities within their city, they don't use the pathways, they don't, you know, they might think of the broads as just the water, but 76% of people that live in and around our city don't use it to its fullest, or certainly by half. So how, how do we go about changing that then? I mean, we want people to come and visit, but we want people to use it as well, so how do you change that? Well, I mean, I think that the initiatives that we've got with Visit Britain, Visit England, with uh, Norwich Beat, you know, all of these things are massive, massive steps in the right direction. And, um, you know, I couldn't have got half of the visibility that I've got. I mean, my, my social media is, is, is key, absolute key, but the other half is actually partnering with people like these guys here. Because, you know, I can't, I can't build this train, I need to jump on somebody else's train, you know, and um, everybody works together, so these partnerships are very, very key. It's probably worth saying that we nurture and build relationships with national and international media. We've got various techniques and systems where we can put a message out to a wide audience. And therefore, with the work that we collaborated on, you've got great coverage in The Guardian. And we've had Twice. Yes. And, and, and <laughs> how did that affect your business hands? <laughs> it was, well, it was uh, Independent one Sunday, Guardian the next, and then Guardian last week. So, um, and, you know, this is all thanks to these guys, uh, you know, working on my behalf, really. Um, you know, I can put up pretty pictures and I can take people out and make them feel wonderful at the end of it, but I need to get people there. And it's these partnerships that actually really help that. So. And we're only as good as the content we receive, and it's an open door, um, and the teamwork, type, we are a small team, but when there are opportunities, we absolutely go for it, because we know the impact we can have. Do we have any more questions? Yes. There you are. No hands were going up, you see. There are gentlemen back here. And I'll come something over there. Thank you. Um, David Field from the Zoological Society is down here. Uh, firstly, um, Vicky, I really want to applaud and acknowledge the accessibility initiatives that, that Visit England are, are pursuing. I mean, that's so, so important for us that our, our tourism, our, our outdoor experiences need to be accessible. Is it also including uh, a sort of inclusivity agenda so that there are many other barriers such as financial, cultural, which also need to be addressed so that we can um, open up open access for all? And just the second part of that question, if I may, um, uh, Caroline, how is the accessibility and inclusivity agenda being addressed by Norwich B and in particular City of Storms? Mm -hmm. Someone tried to write me on Vicky first or? As it. Okay. Okay, um, well, good question. At the moment, um, because of the tourism sector deal, the whole area of accessibility has been something that's sort of been rumbling along in the background. We've um, worked on it for the past 10 years, really, and we've been making steady progress. 
And interestingly, in some areas, it's still not particularly high on the agenda, and we, we know there's still work to be done. I think we have taken steps over 30 years to widen um, people's awareness of accessibility to outside of just the wheelchair user and to push out and I think there's still more work we can do on, on pushing to the, the uh, pushing into the inclusive areas. I'm not aware of any particular projects at the moment but I think it's only a matter of time, especially with the success in the tourism sector deal, um, <coughs> it will all, it's all part of that, that planning certainly. Um, but I think the drive of accessibility was originally driven by um, the change in the law with the um, Disability Discrimination Act and then obviously that developed into the Equality Act. So it was very much seen as a, a there was a gap in the market that, and that's where Visit England stepped in to actually drive awareness and to help businesses become compliant with the regulations. So I think in time it will, it will develop, but as I say, at the moment we're still just pushing the envelope with, with the other elements that we have. Now, I like your bit of the answer. Yes, so I can speak from a big point of view of Visit Norwich. So we are obviously working with the 2040 project um, and part of that is one of the pillars is about being an accessible city. And Alice Whitney, I think I saw you earlier. Um, there's the Create Norwich project working with young schools and one of them, the St. Clair School. Clare School. Um, I'm, like, I'm looking forward to being able to coach uh, and they're looking into accessibility needs for all. Um, one of our hosts produced their own accessibility map. We're going to make that part and part of uh, the website that we're building. So we need to do better, but we're actually starting to engage with people that can tell us what we should have in there. We're not the experts. I think somebody had their hand up over here. Oh. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Carolyn Atkins. I work for um, a company on the North Norfolk Coast called Wells and Meetings. It's an art, heritage and community centre. that opened last summer after a £5 million um, lottery uh, funding. Um, but the question was, it was a slide that Vicky had up about where people come to Norfolk and you had um, the hotels and the B&Bs and then you had 12% community campsites. But the thing that wasn't on that slide, but at least I didn't spot it, was about Airbnb and the impact of Airbnb in this region because particularly on the North Norfolk coast, we've got so many people who now open up their bedrooms and have got a spare room and they've got Airbnb people coming to stay and they are also promoting the county. Um, and how you're interacting with them and so whether you're tra tracking them. Good question. <laughs> Very good question. Um, Airbnb uh, is a little bit like trip advice I was about five years ago um, and um, it's surprisingly common how often this uh, a, a question about Airbnb pops up. Um, I'm not aware of any specific um, analytics on the impact of Airbnb but I can certainly go back to my colleagues in the research team and ask them if there's anything that they are working on because it obviously is, it is um, uh, quite a, a key player in the industry and I'll, I'll feed that information back to Carol and she can circulate it. Um, we have recently partnered with the experiences side of Airbnb, not the, not the home element. Um, and we've just come to the end of a, a sort of a match funded project to actually develop um, businesses and introduce Airbnb experiences to some of our destination partners. Um, with you to get in your businesses onto the experiences. You're nodding as if you're, you're familiar with it. It's, yeah. Yeah. I've, I'm, I'm on there and I've got experience of it. Um, yeah. Wonderful. It's, it's quite an, an interesting programme and, and um, do ask me about it. I can, I can give you some details. And particularly having come from a visitor attraction background, what is quite interesting with this particular um, offer is that um, obviously there's a, a commission to be paid if you register your experience on there, but if you're a charity organisation, they waive the, the commission, so it's completely free. So it's quite an interesting idea. Um, but um, it, as I say, it's not um, it's not a partnership with the home section; it's a partnership with the experiences section. So sort of half answer that. But I'll, I'll look, I'll look uh, into it back at the office and see if we have got any data or if we plan to have any data. Okay, thank you very much.
Culture in, in Norwich has become very important over the last few years. I'm sure all of you know. Uh, I mean, the Norfolk and Norwich Festival is, a, is one of the big events in uh, the festival calendar across the country. Uh, and when I first came here, the UEA and its writing school was uh, fairly new, and it's grown to be one of the most important in the whole world. So culture is very important to us. Uh, and we have actually another writing event as well, the um, National Centre for Writing in the beautiful Dragon Hall. And our first speaker in this part of the day is Chris Gribble, who's a senior. Marvellous, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of today and the work of the bid. Um, I think culture has become increasingly important in making place special, and that's what kind of our group of people is going to talk about. Ten, even five years ago, thinking about literature, reading, writing, literary translation, cultural tourism, you might think, are they natural bedfellows? Are they the first things that jump to mind when you think of cultural tourism? Possibly not, but thinking about Norwich now as the city of stories, and us as UNESCO, city of literature, there's a really deep connection between what stories can do and what cities of literature can achieve and writers, readers and translators can do. Stories are effectively machines for transmitting information, for changing minds and for making things happen. And with a new narrative for Norwich, this can be a really powerful moment for us to tell our story of the city. So my story today is going to attempt to join together the Voice of God, University Challenge, Dyslexia, <laughs> Learning Library, The Abolition of Slavery, and Brangelina. So that <laughs> is my challenge. I'm going to rise to it, um, possibly. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Chris I'm the Chief Exec of um, National Centre of Writing, formerly Writers' Centre of Norwich. Uh, we do three things at the Writers' Centre. Uh, um, we think about art, the art of writing, of literary translation, of reading. We think about writers, readers, and literary translators, and what they need to thrive in our world. We think about learning. Who learns about creative writing, reading, for enjoyment in schools as adults throughout their lives, here in this country and internationally with our partners? And finally, we are about place. We promote Norwich, the UNESCO City of Literature, the centre of excellence of international exchange of uh, transaction of stories and the messages and changes that stories can bring. And we're here to bring advantage to the city, competitive advantage in terms of its cultural ecology, in terms of its national and international reputation, and the people who live, work and visit here, their experience of Norwich. So I want to talk a little bit about why Norwich is UNESCO City of Literature, why it makes sense for it to be Norwich the City of Stories, and how the heart of narrative um, has to be a truth. And that's why we are incredibly lucky in Norwich to have that at the heart of who and who we are. So Norwich became England's first UNESCO City of Literature in 2012. There were, at that time, we were the sixth city in the world only. There are now 28 cities of literature around the world amongst a network of 160 creative cities and seven designations. Um, the commitment that we have um, as a city of literature, or as creative cities generally, are uh, kind of, well, sixfold, as you can see on the screen behind me. I'm not going to talk about all of those. What I want to briefly mention is that one of our functions as now the National Centre for Writing here in Norwich is to think about um, item two of our strengthening the creation, production, distribution, enjoyment of cultural goods and services, and fostering the creative economy. You can tell these weren't written by writers, they were written by bureaucrats in Paris. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's fine, we'll work with that. And secondly, to integrate culture and creativity into local development strategies and plans. And what that really means is working with partners to make things better for the people who live, work and visit here, and that includes businesses, that includes the tourism sector, visitor ecology, but also the wider culture of the city. Um, we are now the National Centre for Writing, um, and the fantastic Dragon Ball. Um, why did we become, why did we campaign to become England's first city of literature? Um, why Norwich, and what can it do for Norwich, the city of stories? It's a remarkable city. Um, 
we have a thousand year history of writers and artists creating positive social change through writing and literature. And this is not a story that's well known enough. If you go back to the 12th century, Julian of Norwich, who lived in a cell opposite Dragon Hall on King Street, was the first woman to be published in book form in English anywhere in the world. She heard the voice of God through a nut, hence the voice of God, and starting my story early on. And she's a radical who's known around the globe. People travel here from Japan, North America, Southeast Asia to visit her cell all over the world, Julian is known. And if you go online, you will see the far extremes of the new, uh, kind of, the, perhaps, the new spirituality we see how they've embraced Julian. We are the home of Harriet Martineau, who made an appearance briefly on University Challenge last night, I'm told, I wasn't here. Um, I think I've kind of reached my peak kind of achievement now would be on University Challenge, the UNESCO City of Literature. We're home to Gerald, who published Anna Sewell, the writer of Black Beauty, the best-selling novel of the 19th century, the millions of copies it sold. And yet possibly our memorial to Anna Sewell currently is a trough filled with flowers in the old Captain Village. Possibly we might want to think about that in the future, just a, just a suggestion. Um, we were the first city to sign the Library Act. Uh, this city um, made library lending open to members of the public at no cost, the first city outside London in the country. We have the first public library where no cost lending was possible, which is now the library restaurant. It still exists there to this day. Um, we are the home of the UEA, which is the first university in the country to host a literary writing, uh, a literary creative writing MA programme. They had one single student in its first year. It turned out to be Ian McEwen, good staff. Well <laughs> <laughs> He provides the knowledge in our Originesco city of literature lab over there. Uh, thanks, Ian. <laughs> we asked him afterwards and felt like a good idea. Um, anyway, I don't know if you've heard of Robert Hillier. He invented a uh, font, an alphabet, to make dyslexic, so to make um, writing more accessible to dyslexic, so it's clearer and more fluid for them on the page. These are fantastic social innovations for writers and creatives that come from the city. The Millennium Library is the busiest still library in the country with the most number of people through the doors and the most items read and borrowed. We are a really creative city where literature has changed lives, changed the world. Everything from Thomas Paine, who we claim, even though he's from Thetford, it's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> the rocks that he threw from Paris in the French Revolution against the slave trade ended up in the American Wars of Independence and the constitution of that country. That's from Norwich. That is globally world changing. These are writers and thinkers who change the world through literature. So we do have a thousand years of this history. That's what makes us different. That's what makes the city of stories true, one of the many things. And that's what really makes our story powerful when we go out. So, um, what do we do? We, amongst other things, we think about cultural tourism. You've heard briefly already, and we are delighted to be supported by UEA and Norwich Business Improvement District. We've set up a crime writing festival. I keep calling it a crime festival, and that's entirely the problem. So we've a crime writing festival in uh, Norwich. We're now coming up to our sixth year. It's the fastest growing crime writing festival in the country. It was designed to take place in the shoulder season in September in Norwich when there was a lull in what was happening, and it's designed to attract plus 45 minute drive time people there. And we're really making it to the centre of excellence. We are working with the excellent Alice Whitney, who sat here today, and uh, Creative Nation and Sim London on the Talking Statues project, which you'll be able to enjoy further in the Norfolk Norwich Festival programme. We have the brilliant Olivia Cole, voicing dialogue by the absolutely best selling Sarah Perry, as the voice of Mother Julian. You can download these audio pieces to your phone when you're making a tour of the city. I think over 400 listens per week of our statue in the first few weeks of the programme, which was winter, which is pretty amazing, and it will only increase as we go along. And also we have the uh, Nemo Twins, because that's the legal entry. <laughs> I'm not from Norwich, I just do old child. Um, we produce walking maps, uh, it's a lovely Mark Atwood, right of The Handmaid's Tale, who wrote the novel just before The Handmaid's Tale, whilst living in a cottage just outside Lakeland back in the day, and she still comes back to Norwich with her husband once a year for uh, three or four weeks at a time. We're creating right of, uh, walking maps so people can experience the city from a range of its outstanding writers to think about what it means to have grown up in the city, to visit the city, to leave the city, to experience the many layers of history that the city offers through its buildings, its retail offer, its cultural offer, and its history. Um, we're also, and this is uh, where I come on to Rangelina, 
Um, Nottingham is now a UNESCO city literature as well, and in May this year, we are hosting all 28 cities of literature from around the country into Norwich, and then Nottingham, I mean, like, they start here, and then they go to Nottingham. I've heard Nottingham is fine, I don't know what it means, uh, but many are coming to Norwich. Uh, uh, together we're called Notwich, so we have become the branch leader of city brands there. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to learn from these amazing cities, which include Melbourne, which include Reykjavik, which include Derby, which include Ulyanovsk in the Ukraine, Lviv, um, Granada, a whole range of cities of different scales, of different sizes, to think about how they're using literature, their literary heritage, their past, a contemporary offer and they're gathering their plans for the future to drive a whole range of benefits for their city. And that does include economic benefit through cultural tourism, it includes the changing the experience and the understanding of the city so that not only do more people know about the city, they also know what's important to us as people who live in the city about where we live and they can tell the stories. As soon as you start hearing someone else tell the story that you've told them to a third party, you know you've started to make the case for where you are and what is important to you. So we have um, five days of those international cities of literature thinking about how we can drive tourism, how we can increase benefits for people who live, work and visit our cities, share knowledge, share exchange ideas and create partnerships, financially beneficial partnerships in some cases. We can leverage funds together that we would not be able to access otherwise. We can work with partners that we wouldn't otherwise sit around the table with. I came to Norwich in 2006 when we were not even called, we were called uh, National Centre of Writing. Uh, we weren't called Writer Centre Norwich at that point, we were called the New Writing Partnership. There were 2.5, 2.3 members of staff in a very limited programme, sort of squatting in a very tiny couple of rooms off King Street that we're very close to again. And now we are uh, still a small company, but we're 16 members strong. We have a partnership across the city and the county that drives real activity and benefits to the people who live, work and visit here. And we think that with that partnership with the city, with the City of Stories partnership, the City Council and our partners at UEA and the BID, we can drive many more benefits for us. You might want to think about Edinburgh and its ways that it uses its heritage assets and literature and especially commissioning pieces of work to light up buildings, to drive to uh, Wayfair, to increase understanding about both the contemporary buildings that they have and the historical uh, uh, facts that inform some of their development. We might want to look at what Reykjavik has done with a series of talking benches. You sit down next to these statues in five languages. You can download pieces of text about where you are, the city that you're in. You can increase the understanding, get that authentic voice of the place you're in, delivered right to your phone, right to your Bluetooth headset, right to a piece of old-fashioned print in front of you. We're not going to give up on print just because we have the internet. Um, we might want to think about Krakow and what Krakow's do to celebrate. Um, Krakow City Council drove uh, legal change in its city constitution to abolish all taxes for bookshops across the city to protect the independent sector to drive growth. They've created four festivals over a five-year period. They're about to embark on a 28 million euro project to celebrate Stanislav Lem, one of their most famous um, science fiction writers. And they have become possibly the premium uh, book trade capital um, in Eastern Europe over the past eight years, partly as a result of their UNESCO city literature status. So we have a lot of opportunity. Uh, we have a lot of options available to us. Uh, we have a partnership that is really ready to go, I think. Um, we, our primary aim when we became UNESCO City Literature was to create a physical centre of Dragon Hall that could embody what we wanted to become as, as a city of literature. And now we're in a phase and we have the partnership ready to explore the next stage of that to help really make that visible on a national and international scale. And we think that the Cultural Tourism Partnership is a crucial way for us to be able to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, can I just, uh, you know all about these QR codes on your, on your passes. If you want to download things like feedback forms, just use that on your phone and uh, you'll get all the details that you need. You can download all sorts of stuff to your phone from there. So use that if you can. And if you would put where it says 
what did you think of the presenter? Could you put excellent or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, when I first came to Norwich a long time ago, I, I met the CEO of the Norwich Theatre Royal. Theatre Royal is one of the treasures of Norwich. It's done remarkably well. Um, and when I met Dick Condon, he was, some of you will remember Dick, he was a, a much larger than life. He was dressed as a tree. <laughs> and I could never look at him any other way than dressed as a tree. I'm glad to see you haven't come as a tree today. Stephen Crocker, Chief Executive of Norwich Theatre. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Jet said, I'm Stephen Crocker. I'm the Chief Executive of Theatre Royal. And um, it's one of my lovely memories so of kind of starting to know that I was kind of in, in Norwich a little while because when I first arrived in Norwich, people would say to me, You're the guy that took over from Peter Wilson. And then a year into that, I got into a taxi and somebody said to me, you're the guy that took over from the guy that took over from Dick Condon. <laughs> <laughs> a nice barometer of local acceptance. Um, <laughs> so I am going to talk to you about artistic programming to all the cultural destination, which sounds really dull, but I'm hoping to liven it up and just share with you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing at Theatre Royal and Playhouse over the past two or so years to look at our whole vision and how we move forward. And one of the absolute key pillars of that is um, building our role and our position as part of um, the, uh, the, the kind of drive to grow the economy here in Norwich, Norfolk, and indeed the East of England. Now, I arrived in Norwich two years ago, and um, I arrived here having worked in Manchester for the best part of 12 years. And one of the things that absolutely struck me, which I think is really evident here today, is that this is a place where partnership is part of the DNA. And having been in Manchester, which has a phenomenal track record around economic growth in so many different things, they've had to work against the tide of partnership. Believe it or not, it's not a place where partnership is an actual commodity. And so when I arrived here, whilst Manchester might have the track record, the potential I feel here in this place is greater than it ever was in Manchester, which is why I'm so excited to be here myself, but also to lead an organisation I hope can play a really important role in the future of all of these places. So I was given quite a lovely gift when I arrived here, which was to work with the trustees of it all to think about our vision for the future. And I wanted to kind of share that first off because of the second part of that sentence. So to be a leading UK regional theatre, being both a creative resource and cultural ambassador for Norwich, Norfolk and the East of England. And we chose very consciously to write that large, that actually we are situated here in a place. And um, if you go down the next sort of level, our business plan. Um, you'll see the mission statement underneath there and the pillars through which um, we will deliver that. And I'll just go from right to left quickly. Resilience and sustainability is really important for us. We're, our business model is, is um, unique in the theatre sector in that um, we don't see regular public subvention. We earn all of our income ourselves, but we are a registered charity. We work to make a surplus every year, that surplus is absolutely driven back into our charitable objectives. Our audiences are quite phenomenal. They're the absolute engine alongside our programme of what we do. Theatre Royal boasts, uh, Theatre Royal Playhouse together, boasts an average um, capacity of 71% of all shows across the year. That sits along a benchmark of probably about 58% for the rest of the sector. So our loyalty is phenomenal here. Um, our learning and participation work is growing and growing. Many of you will have seen that about three years ago. A brand new state of the art building popped up where an old chapel used to be, just the other side of this wall. And I'm delighted to say that that programme is growing. It's the subject of a whole presentation in and of itself, but we now see about 400 participants passing through that building every single week, which is absolutely delightful. And what I thought I'd focus on today is our artistic programme, and particularly how we're using and shaping and developing that programme to support the whole agenda that we've been talking about today. And now I'll just share with you a couple of things. We have four strategic principles that underpin the work we choose to put on our stages. They are quality first, breadth and balance, that we are through one organisation with three stages. And then the fourth is that everything we do, we will try to aim to support the cultural ecology 
economy, recognising that we're one of the largest cultural organisations <coughs> in this region and that we have a very important role to play in how we programme and work in partnership to drive that agenda. Because what's really clear to me is what's been said several times today, is that both Norwich and Norfolk are unique places in a great many ways, from the city's amazing history of diversity all the way through to you know, the very landscape, the amazing um, natural attributes that the county brings. Um, but it's also a place that has a really special relationship with culture. I was absolutely blown away by it when I first came here how very much culture is at the table. And this is a really good demonstration today that Chris and I have been invited to be part of this dialogue. But also within my own organisation, a statistic that staggers me every time I hear it, that 25% of the population of Norfolk will cross the threshold of theatre world or playhouse in every single year. That is a staggering statistic. And I've never been able to do the research of other regional venues, but I think we would stand out in the crowd in terms of that level of loyalty. It's clear to me that culture is in the DNA of this place already, so it absolutely should be at the heart of our growth agenda. And that's why we are also working really hard to work with the City Council around the 2040 vision, which is delight delighting to see has culture at its heart, but also we play quite a key role, as does the National Centre for Writing, in the Culture Drives Growth Strategy, which was developed by the LEP back in 2017, and uh, we continue to play a key role in terms of supporting that. So, how do we do it? Um, we do it through four strands of our work, and I'm just going to share a little bit about why we've chosen those strands, some stuff that we've done already, and a couple of things that are in the pipeline for you. And we do work really hard to kind of measure our success around this through things like drive time, an economic impact, and I've got some interesting things to share with you about how that's shaping and developing. So, the first strand of work um, in our artistic program is around dance. Um, for us, it's very clear that um, major cultural destinations are shaped by internationalism, by actually looking beyond the confines of the country and actually celebrating <coughs> cultural diversity in all of its forms. And dance, as an art form in and of itself, has enormous potential to do that. Um, we also think it helps us, we've coined the phrase of theatre or destination programming, things that make people come here specifically just to see something that we're putting on our stage, or perhaps make people kind of sit up and notice the place. Um, we're also really interested in city-wide programming and partnership. I think the joined upness is very, very helpful in terms of promoting a joined up cultural offer. There are lots of examples and opportunities for doing that. And it's why we now take a three-stage approach to what we do across the three stages we have in the city. And we're also consorting and partner working both around the UK and increasingly internationally as well. And then one of the mantras around this is never before in Norwich. There are those really special moments where something is a first for this place. And there's a few examples I'll show you, but just that civic pride it's fantastic Norwich should have that. Well, Norwich deserves all of the things that we're all working towards, and, and it's kind of keeping that front and centre. So, here's an example of something that came to us last year. So that was uh, at his uh, Costanza, arguably one of the most exciting dance companies in the world right now, founded by um, the legend in uh, the legendary dancer of his generation, Carlos Acosta. Um, Acosta Danza came to us 
last summer. It was the first in a brand new program in Australia of international work. Um, and it did some quite amazing things for us. So um, the show entirely sold out with a waiting list of 250 people waiting for tickets. Um, and it saw some quite interesting things. So 52% of the people who came to that show came from outside of a 45-minute drive time. An average for theatre world is about 38% driving that distance. And even more pleasingly, 35% of those people came from beyond the 90 minutes. And again, we'd expect something more than like 12% to come to that drive time um, across the programme. Um, so a really exciting moment. And looking at that video, I should say, the answer to the question on everyone's lips is no, not completely naked. <laughs> <laughs> and you're all thinking it. <laughs> Um, going forward, this remains a really important part of our strategy and over the next two or three years we've set ourselves the challenge to bring dance from every continent within the world, if we can. We're making some progress, so uh, in a few weeks' time we'll have uh, the godfather of contemporary dance, Mark Morris, will be with us with a show called Pepperland, which is a homage to the Beatles. Um, then in autumn, we've confirmed, say, a Paolo Dance Company will be here bringing a huge burst of Brazilian energy into the city for a week or so. Then we have <coughs> Sydney Dance Company, Netherlands Dance Theatre, and Albinelli from the US all in the pipeline going forward as well. And again, we would absolutely expect those kind of drive times and that kind of um, impact on cultural tourism to come through. And then also at the mid scale, we're doing a lot of work with Dance East in order to bring work from Ipswich to Norwich for Norwich Playhouse. And we're really excited, we? going back to the past. I'm delighted to say that in the autumn, um, through a partnership that we formed with Birmingham Hippodrome and Land and South as well, the Costa Panza will return to Norwich again, but this time they will open their European tour here, which is enormously exciting. So this tour programme um, has had one showing in Cuba, it will have another showing in Cuba, the first professional show before it tours around Europe and then the world will be here in Norwich. A really exciting moment. And if anybody does know dance, you'll know a well-known piece of choreography called Rooster, which is set to music with Rolling Stones. And I can share top secret, Carlos is going to dance the role of the Rooster, not to be missed. So, um, moving on to um, opera and classical music, which is another key strand for us. It was very clear to me, actually, that theatre were playing a role within the classical music scene in Norwich would be filling a gap in terms of large-scale, consistent orchestral provision, and similarly satisfying an audience appetite. So we've, and we've had six or seven large-scale classical concerts at Theatre Royal, where averaging audiences of about 900 per concert, so clearly there is an appetite for this work. I'm really interested in how we join this up in a city-wide way, through work with work that Marion does, through Music in Norwich, and working with other classical music partners. Um, I will say something controversial, not every city has a dedicated concert hall. Many cities in this country function very well without one, by working in partnership together. And that's probably all I'm going to say, that'll be a question on it later. I'll give you money. Um, it's about building our audiences for a genre, and the more joined up work that can be done about that, the better. It's again about internationalism, and another thing which I think some people might have put on here for me, it's about Sunday evenings. There's a real opportunity in this city around Sunday evenings. And so we specifically try and target these concerts to bring people into the city on a Sunday night. Um, there's just a little bit of a flavour of some of the work that's coming up. And sort of looks like an anti-Brexit protest, doesn't it? <laughs> Russia, Congress, Iceland, then back to the good old RSNO and the um, but also in terms of opera, we are really delighted um, to have had Blindborn performing here for many, many, many years, and in which touring opera we have a relationship, but actually for this year, after a 46-year break from performing in Norwich, Welsh National Opera will return with the show at Norwich Playhouse, coming to the main stage of Theatre Royal next year. And I don't think there are many cities in the country that can boast three international world-class opera companies. But as I said at the beginning, Norwich absolutely deserves it. And it comes down to audience loyalty. Um, at Theatre Royal, we average 85% attendance opera. The national average is 56%. So we have the audience appetite. We just need to keep stretching our audiences and delivering bigger and more. Um, just skipping on to drama very quickly. 
Um, we are the city of stories, and I think some of this is best represented through drama. Um, we'll continue to develop audiences for high quality work. It's about developing relationships between an audience and a company, and I feel quite passionately about that, that when we're working with national partners, we look at how they can become partners for the whole of Norwich. So we've just launched a four-year partnership with the Royal Shakespeare Company that will see work come on to both of our stages, theatre and playhouse, but also a huge amount of community engagement work over that period as well. Um, it's about injecting theatre and playhouse into the creation of work nationally. I think there is huge benefit in us sending our name out with work that we've had a part in here in the city, and I'll talk about that again in a moment. Um, absolutely. So just um, taking the Norwich brand alongside us being Norwich Literal and Norwich Playhouse around the country and abroad. And within the next six months, where we'll be announcing one of our first um, major co-productions um, in terms of drama. Then on to our extraordinary strand, which a lot of my colleagues joke is just a kind of vehicle for me to do fun things I quite like. But you know. Yeah, there's got some perks. Um, we specifically look at quite a unique event theatre, um, also opportunities where we can coordinate our programme across our three performance spaces, um, and also particularly looking at multi-site work in the future, so actually we've got some interesting projects that look at how we join up, play by and Theatre Royal, and animate the spaces in between the two, which again is really interesting on a city-wide scale. Um, blended work on and off the stage, as I mentioned with the RSC, um, particularly partnership opportunities. There have been some great opportunities for us to partner with other organisations like National Centre for Writing, the Arts Centre, Norfolk Norwich Festival, but also this sense of you saw it first in Norwich. And I think that's something really special for us to keep kind of hammering home and pursuing opportunities there. So here's one good example. Well, we are currently creating a show, which is really exciting, so the show will feel very fresh every night. Uh, we're working around the story of three chefs, Raw and Airplane, and they're flying back, back into London, having already, that week, pretty much travelled over 30,000 miles. And the story revolves around those chefs, their life stories, and as an audience member, who experience a five-course tasting menu, you come to encounter them, and also very much the kind of various philosophies around being up in the sky and, and how humans have progressed and uh, the movement of people as well. <coughs> So that was a fantastic show called Gastronomic, which Theatre Royal commissioned from Norwich-based theatre company Curious Directive. It took place in our Stage 2 building last September, and what it did was not only showcase some fantastic creativity in the city, but we worked with four restaurants from around the city, including Assembly House, Richard, if you see him, was very much part of that, um, Benedict's, Namaste Village and Shiki all contributed foods as well as showcasing um, great stories actually when to showcase the food offer. What's really exciting about that show is it now has its London run confirmed for this year. So uh, Norwich Central and Shoreditch Town Hall co-commission will show for three weeks in Shoreditch. In Shoreditch they'll be working with the Michelin starred Clover Club which is attached to Shoreditch Town Hall. So, if you fancy seeing the show again with a different style of cooking, get along. Um, but great to see the Norwich brand taken into London, the show that came from here. And also in terms of the stats, again I mentioned the averages of 38 and 12. This saw 60% of people coming from beyond 45 and 42 beyond 19. And actually a really pleasing number of London postcodes coming up to see this show as it opened here. And now to another example. Still singing the tunes. In fact, Act Six is incredible. It's a broken pressure. It defies all the conventions of the musical theatre show I was expecting to see. It's about to get over from There you go, 
that is a new musical called Six, which had its premiere at Norwich Playhouse last summer, a project we were absolutely thrilled to be part of. Um, and again, I'll just show you some of the stats. So fabulously, that's 49% of people attending that show being completely new bookers to us, which was great, just showing that actually, you know, program drives new attendance, new program drives new attendance. We're also, again, pleasing 52% of people coming from beyond the 45 minutes. What's absolutely amazing for this, talking about scene first in Norwich and taking the Norwich name out there, is this tweet. So this show, we opened here in Norwich, is now nominated for five Olivier Awards. And if you don't know the Olivier's, they're the Oscars of the theatre world, um, which is just enormously exciting that came from here. And um, going back to statistics, the award ceremony is on Sunday evening. Myself and two of my colleagues are going. And I can 100% guarantee you'll hear the screams if that show wins. <laughs> and if it wins, I can 150% guarantee there'll be some gale force handovers on Monday morning <laughs> at Norwich Theatre World. And then finally, a very quick counter to the last round of our work, um, which is our commercial strand. So we work really hard to be the venues for comedy in Norfolk. It was really pleasing that The Telegraph did a top comedy picks yesterday. Ten of the 15 shows listed there will all come to our venues. So we're securing some of the very best comedy coming to us, such as Eddie Izzard, Josh Whitcomb, and Tom Stade, just within the next couple of months. There's also special one-off productions that we work very hard to bring here. Um, we were delighted that Ian McKellen is celebrating his 18th birthday, having done some shows at the Mad Market, doing a few more with us in the Irish Playhouse at the end of April, and also shows like um, Here Come the Boys, which is the biggest Strictly show, which I believe sold out in 20 minutes at Norwich Theatre Hall, all this record. Um, our Christmas offer is hugely important. We will continue with Norwich Fitral Pantomime, which is produced by us, but also within the next two years, we'll be producing a second show, a slightly different show, down at Norwich Playhouse as well. And then blockbuster musicals, which is what many will know the Theatre Royal for, and just coming up that are on sale at the moment, shows like The Bodyguard, which is with us in a few weeks' time, Matilda, the smash hit show again from the RSC, that's over the summer, and Kinky Boots, which has absolutely defied belief in terms of demand for those tickets in the autumn. And here's the flavour of just one of those. just from that show alone, so spent in restaurants, invested in hotels, in retail, which is fantastic. We'll do similar pieces of analysis for Matilda this coming summer, for our pantomime, and of course for a show I'll tell you about in a second, because again, I think that all helps play into the narrative that the culture has within the growing place. And our pantomime as well, which I have mentioned, so this is some research from December, January, so not the pantomime just gone, the one before that. There's some interesting things here. So actually this hits back on our 45 minute drive time, which tells us what we know about pantomime as it's a more local audience. 
Um, but interestingly, we surveyed these audiences and 62% make a day of it when they come to our pantomime, which is really interesting. So they're booking their tickets first, but then they do are saying they extend their visit in the city. But also interestingly, 40% of our audience say it's their main reason for coming into the city. So again, there's even more joint at work, and I think we can do a third of all with other local businesses around the pantomime trade as well. So, I'm very nearly at the end, only to say that the next in this kind of our programming is like this. It goes on sale on Monday to our um, girl friends, and then it will go on sale to all of our friends on the 9th, on general sale by the 24th of April. We are anticipating huge demand, I wish you the very best of luck. We'll be to yes. We are anticipating that about 65,000 people will go through that show across that period of time, and I invite everybody that wants to kind of work with us. Those people are coming in the city to see this show, that they ought to be spending their money and extending their dwell time as far and wide as we can and come and talk to us about how we can work together on that. And then a final little plug for me is at Theatre Royal over the next few weeks, you're going to see a new space. We're going to be focusing some of our attention on making sure that our front of house spaces absolutely live up to the quality of the work we put on the stage. And this is our first development. This is our new restaurant at Theatre Royal. Um, it's opening on the 30th of April. It definitely has a new look, a very fresh, contemporary new look that we're delighted with. And a new name is coming very soon, unless you bribe Mr. Burridge, who will be able to tell you like that. You see the subtleness there, will be. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so please do look out for that. We can have a big old party to celebrate. There'll be some more information coming out. And do come along. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The only disappointment for me was you didn't mention the mirror in the pantomime a couple of years ago. The wife thought was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> only some of you saw it. Didn't it? Right, I'm going to get uh, Nikki Rostos up here as well, and uh, Chris, and Rostos, sorry. Um, don't forget to use your QR code, and you two will share a microphone, I've got one over there. Questions? We won't be, oh no, alright, no, you keep that one. Press it at the bottom. Anybody got any questions, quickly, about this? Why do we think, Chris, that um, having a National Centre for Writing in Norwich makes a difference? Um, it's not in London, yeah. which really helps for a National Centre of anything. Um, I spent, uh, I, I went to um, a publishing event in 2008 in London, and someone said to me, oh, marvellous, you're in Norfolk, do they have books there now? Uh, uh, so there's a good reason to become a national centre in England, so yes, there's a city of literature, even if it's just a weak revenge on your sorry head. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's basically, it's, it, it's in, in recognition of the work that we've done, the partnership, the UEA, the stuff, the Millennium Library, um, the publishing industry that we have here, and I think it does a lot for us on the national and international side. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, only that I think, you know, being the first world, you know, scarcity of literature was a really big thing for the city, and that's why the City Council supported it. And, you know, it made it to University Challenge last night, as Chris has already said. So, as far as I'm concerned, that's the main reason I'm having it. <laughs> and as far as. <laughs> <laughs> We've got plenty of other microphones, don't worry. <laughs> Right, do we have any questions about this and how important it is? Because I suspect that actually the festival and the writers, the festival makes a big difference because the, the theatre world gets involved with the festival. We do, yeah. Yeah, and that brings a lot of people into the city. Um, is there anything? Yes. If I gave you one wish or a magic wand, what would you do to help your businesses and your enterprises in Norwich? <laughs> it, it's a really interesting question. Um, uh, I don't know, it's meant to sound like a very, very dull wishing person who's about to waste their wish. Um, but I think um, the, the, the mindset of the meetings, incentives, conference, and exhibition offer for the city, if we could work together to really pull that together, that would transform how we're able to bring in people from around the country. That includes dull things like hotel vision, transport infrastructure. Drummed up conversations about it, so it's quite dullish. 
but it's quite a broad one. Yeah, I think I'd absolutely add to that, and particularly in relation to hotels. You know, going forward, our strategy, as I've alluded to, involves large numbers of international artists coming into this city and finding space to put all of those performers together with the right level of accommodation is an enormous challenge and something that we have to kind of look at jointly. I guess the other thing I'd add um, is probably slightly more kind of wishful and philosophical is let's just agree to change some of the narrative. So a couple of things I picked up just this morning is the sort of, it might feel quite glib to complain about parking, complain about traffic, but it's not that bad, I promise you. It's just perpetuating something of a narrative here. <coughs> We've got to stop it. Um, and you know, this term of graveyard rubbish, that is a devastating term <laughs> to still be in circulation. Let's just all commit leaving here today that any time somebody says that to us, we'll shut them down on it. Because I think we need to. I think that, and then the important bit of that today is the stories, because we've got to be really careful about the stories we tell. And our stories have to be positive, because cities would die for what we've got here. And we just need to keep telling those stories over and over again and not kind of sort of slightly understanding ourselves and work together to do that. And do you think we haven't done in the past then? I think we've done pretty well, considering, but I think this is a really a, a kind of step change where, and I hate that word, it's very bureaucratic, isn't it? But you know, that is the moment where a lot of, I think we're just about ready to roll. And some of the things that cultural organisations have done, particularly in terms of some of the programming, having the National Writers Centre here, having probably one of the, the, probably the fourth most prominent festivals in the country with the Norfolk and Norwich. I think the time just feels right, and I think people are up for it. And um, I think it's a true story of so I think we just need to start from there. We're going to start second. <laughs> <Yeah. Another laughs> <one. laughs> there we are. That's, that's, that's the first vote that's wrong, and it's taken, <laughs> us, it's, it's taken us quite a while to get to there. Any other questions about this and how you can work together? Because actually, there was quite an appeal from the Theatre Royal, and I, I suspect that that means that you don't think that people have been coming to you to see how you can join things up. No, I think uh, since I arrived here two years ago, I've, I've always said you know, there are opportunities for partnership at lots and lots and lots of levels. You know, we recognise, particularly through that commercial strand of programme, it's quite singular focus. People will drive those distances because they want to see Lenny's and they don't want to go to London. Let, let's, let's work together to demonstrate to them the rest of the offer that's here in Norwich. So how would that work then? That's great. It yeah. sounds like a great sound bite, but what do you, what do, you yeah. do? Do you do you do a special deal at a restaurant, restaurant and the theatre together or what? I think, it's, I think it's a lot about us bringing brand and marketing together actually and there's some really good work that's taking place here on a city level and indeed on a regional level about promoting the whole, the, the whole um, gamut of things that can happen. So it's, if you've got things that are going on during that time, you know, um, let's get organisations together and talking about kind of cross-promotion, I think it's, it's there. Yeah. Uh, I also think that it, for a long time the, the very high level of the FR, the visiting friends and relative tourism within this area, is an opportunity for us because that story spread really quickly between people. And if you can get your friends and relatives who you visit, if they're telling the visitors the right stories, pointing in the right directions for the particular attractions, the unique offer that we have, then that's really powerful and also incredibly relatively cheap resource. So the storytelling and spreading around the FR market is one of our key opportunities. Yes. I can see you nodding most of the time. Very much so, very much so. Um, many more uh, from Gerard. Um, so two things, one's an observation and then one question. The observation is to say I, am, I was born in Norwich but I actually only started working here eight months ago. I just want to pick up on what Nikki said. Guys, the Norwich is on fire. I mean, seriously, the level of ambition, the confidence, um, and the stories that you were telling. You know, I've come from Ipswich being my work base. Ipswich would kill for the, the, all these things that Norwich has. It's that first observation. Also, the point about partnership, I've so found that to be true. So here's the question. Chris, those facts, I was trying to memorize them and scribble them down. What's going to be the way that people like me, everyone here, can have these stories, or a distillation of the best ones, accessible so we can all be out as brilliantly briefed ambassadors in our conversations with mates, mates in London, 
you know, I want to know all of those facts. I want to have memorised all those amazing firsts. How many did you get? One in three, I think. I probably got one in three. So, and I don't know whether the bid to some extent is part of that, but we need to, we need to distill this down and feed some Can that go on with our, with our whatever COVID is, yeah. Put that Does on. that make sense? I just yeah. want to feed the sound bites and I will rave yeah. about the things you've shown with us. Carolyn will be talking about it in the, in the bids work in short form. We've been working with the bid. We haven't succeeded yet in that we met a bid to um, Culture Europe to do a marketing and um, cultural tourism bid for the city to use the accreditation yeah. for businesses. We didn't get the funds at the time we went for it, but we're looking for other sources so we can help engage businesses, form a consortium board for businesses to take advantage, brief people that have packs for cultural tourism businesses, taxi drivers, ambassadors, to start sharing their stories. So that's again back on the agenda for how we, now we've sort of, um, now we've kind of built the extension of Dragon Ball, as we like to call it, we're going to refocus on that and get the stories out there. Good. Any more, very quickly, in the, yeah. Do you see that always happens? Just when we're getting to the end. <laughs> Which has all the 10 facts about Norwich as a city of literature, as a press pack, and things you do go there. You have more than 10. These are the 10 facts. I mean, they're all about 10. Good plug. Good plug. Do you want to give the website address? National Centre for Writing Dog. Don't you care? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to our panel. And, and I would just say that apart from all of this, it's which would kill to be top of the table. <laughs> <laughs> Step into the traveller's shoes. Please welcome the best known travel journalist in the country, Simon Cole. Well, hello everybody. A huge pleasure to be here. And I'm going to reveal something first about Stuart. He and I have something in common. We were both BBC studio managers. Unbelievable but true. Now, when you become a studio manager, which is effectively a, an engineer in the studio at um, the BBC, you get a voice test and somebody listens to your voice. And if you're good enough, you get plucked for stardom. And that's exactly <laughs> what happened to Stuart. Unfortunately, um, Mine was so bad, they said, you must never speak on the BBC. <laughs> so, um, being the BBC, that didn't work very well. But now I find myself as the voice of travel doom. Um, and I'm afraid that uh, today there is going to be a bit of gloom, uh, doom and gloom in the next uh, 40 minutes exactly. Um, because there are some things coming down the track which um, are not going to be great and I can imagine that you'd much rather have been here in this wonderful place in the uh, great uh, Nevea uh, Ballroom in 1835 when on Tuesdays ladies had dancing lessons with um, the one and only Frank Nevea. Um, the motto was chase here, chase there, turn your toes like Frank Nevea. And the uh, ladies and gentlemen were able to uh, have dancing lessons in the afternoon. So I'm sorry that you're not enjoying that, but it could be worse. You could be in the five-hour-long cabinet meeting. Um, <laughs> and um, on that subject, I'm afraid there will be a bit today about Brexit, uh, which has completely split the country, completely split Norwich. Um, Chloe Smith voted against all the soft Brexit options last night. Um, Clive uh, Lewis voted for all of them. Um, and as you will know, Norwich voted 56% to leave, but Norfolk overall voted 59%. So, no, wrong way round. Wrong way round. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Norwich voted 56% to remain, and uh, Norfolk as a whole, including Norwich, voted 59% to leave. So, interesting times. So, what, why are you listening to me? Um, well, it's because I'd like to say that um, having uh, 
failed to um, uh, be plucked for stardom, I thought I would um, uh, do something which didn't involve doing any work. I would become an influencer. And we've got twins that travel coming up shortly and look forward to, to an argument with them. Um, so I, this was uh, recently, I was just filming in uh, Malta. Um, got worse after that. I had to go and taste beer in the Grand Place in, uh, in Brussels. And while you're sitting there working very hard, on your business, bear in mind that I am trying to go on a Cuba fly drive or indeed <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, being massaged by lovely Nadine while talking nonsense to a BBC camera. I suppose to Stuart, he talks sense to a BBC camera. <laughs> it is a tough life, ladies and gentlemen, but somebody has to do it. Oh, and this isn't what you think. Um, I went to a uh, a visit Ipswich event, there was simply no atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right, we're going to rattle through what's happening globally. Then I'm going to talk about Brexit, sorry. Then I'm going to talk about the various, um, uh, uh, the, the competition that um, uh, Norwich faces. Then I'll talk about some of the great opportunities that you have to put Norwich on the map. Um, <coughs> It's terrific that we are here all pointing in the same direction because there are going to be some great opportunities. Uh, this is the most, is the only slide that you need to look at and try and maybe work out what's going on. I promise there won't be more graphs. This basically is just what HSBC says will be happening in 2030. So China takes over from the US as the biggest global economy. India leapfrogs from um, uh, seventh. Eight, seventh place to uh, third. Uh, the good news is that although we drop a place, we're still ahead of France. <laughs> uh, passenger numbers, which are a really important element if you are looking at inbound tourism, are going to double by uh, 8.2 billion. That's that you, you might say, well, of course, people make forecasts like that all the time. But actually, the relentless growth of uh, aviation at about 5 or 6% compound every year makes that uh, entirely feasible. And the centre of gravity for aviation is moving eastwards. Uh, the US used to be by far the uh, biggest market for uh, aviation. Europe's very important, obviously, but it is moving towards China. And by 2025, there we are. Um, China will become the largest air passenger market in the world. Oh no! I do remember <laughs> nearly three years ago now. Well, it's all going very well, isn't it? This was the day before the referendum. That's my theory of Ryanair urging everybody to vote. Uh, remain. That went well, didn't it? <laughs> um, there we had um, Theresa May deciding she was going to call a general election, and it's all been going uh, uh, very well since then. This was uh, last week, so um, ancient history in Brexit terms, and you'll remember obviously that our other uh, important political leader uh, had um, his own response. So, uh, extraordinary times, but whether you voted leave or remain, I can tell you what I could have told you actually the day after the referendum about what is going to happen and what the impact on Norwich businesses will be. So um, we, are, uh, we are taking back control of our borders, which means that we're actually giving back control uh, of our borders to um, Europe. Uh, yes, if there is a no deal Brexit, then suddenly everything becomes extremely complicated. Your passport could be valid for 14 months and 29 days and still, on the 13th of April, not be regarded as valid enough. Uh, we are not going to be able to use the, uh, the fast um, passport queues and we will, by 2021, whether it's a, a hard or a soft Brexit or whatever, we will be signing up for uh, the kinds of uh, online visas that you currently have to do for Turkey, for the US, and so on. Um, and that is absolutely known, and that was absolutely known uh, in 2016. Um, it gets really exciting if you're driving. This is an international driving permit. These are three that I prepared earlier because, yes, you're familiar. Um, 
UK driving license with a nice little EU symbol is going to continue to be um, uh, valid in the UK after a no deal Brexit, but uh, you won't be valid in the EU. So you will need for most countries a 1968 international driving permit, for Spain a 1949 international driving permit, and for plucky Liechtenstein a 1926 international driving permit, but luckily Liechtenstein is quite easy to miss. So um, there we are. Uh, But it does give you some idea of the the things that uh, await us. The European Health Insurance Guide, I've just renewed mine. I'm not sure if the Department for Health is trying to tell me something, but it's valid until the 7th of March 2024. Mm. But in fact, it could be valid until the 12th of April 2019, because if we leave without a deal, it will cease to be effective and there will be absolutely no uh, opportunity for emergency medical treatment anywhere in the EU apart from Portugal where they've said go on we'll look after you it's all right and this is a really important map put out by Kent County Council Um, it looks like something that's kind of left over from dad's army but no (laughs) what is going to happen from the 13th of April onwards if there is no deal now I personally think, but what do I know, that the chances of no deal are relatively low, although um, uh, Michel Barnier this morning said that they were increasing all the time and it now looks very likely. Um, However, I can tell you, because I've talked to a number of tour operators across the UK, that already this sort of thing is persuading people not to travel. Big uh, uh, German tour operator, I was talking to a Scottish um, uh, tourism provider um, he was just told sorry we're not going to be using your hotel um, this summer because we have simply no idea if we're going to be able to get there on our bus so obviously having damage already besides the billions of pounds which are being squandered uh, in preparation for things that may or may not happen um, which could be spent on um, uh, capital improvements of course uh, and your passport is um, th- that is possibly one thing which is going to benefit in terms of inbound tourism uh, the fact that your passport could be uh, decided could be um, regarded as not valid so it's uh, the great news is although we're not going back to these passports I know that none of you apart from me and Stuart are old enough to remember (laughs) these passports so but we're not going to get them back we are though going to go from this horrid European burgundy to this nice um, blue, exactly the same shade as uh, North Korea and (laughs) funnily enough the same shade as Croatia which is in the European Union. There we are. Um, Now all kinds of impacts. Um, I know that uh, Ryanair is quite possibly your uh, favourite airline but what Ryanair does is pretty important and they uh, well, you would have seen probably yesterday that uh, EasyJet lost 10% of its value because it said that the market was soft because there was too much uncertainty about Brexit. Uh, Ryanair, uh, which is actually extremely profitable, um, has an interesting model of basically saying we will cut the fares to whatever is necessary to persuade people to travel. So, traveling tomorrow, look at that. Uh, one of the more ridiculous uh, routes you'll see, exited to Naples, £9.99. Um, and the air passenger duty is £13 on that, so Ryanair is taking a hit on the basis that you will probably pay more than £4 for an overpriced sandwich. Um, it's an extraordinary time to be travelling. Ryanair has already said that it's not expanding in the UK at the same rate as it is in the rest of Europe. Uh, it's a tough time for airlines. Um, Primera Air, uh, Icelandic airline, went out of business in October. Ah, wow, Air, an Icelandic airline, went out of business last week, um, stranding lots of people. There is, I think, a lot of uncertainty about travel. And to some extent, if that keeps people in the UK, then that could work to the advantage of 
businesses like yours, um, and you'll remember that British Airways last summer uh, decided to allow somebody to hack it's everybody who booked a ticket between um, May and September. So all of those details, your credit card number, your uh, three digits on the back, all um, have been appropriated. Uh, there's also, of course, um, all kinds of things that can go wrong with air travel. In fact, we've rarely seen so many awful, awful interruptions. The drone, which um, wrecked Christmas for a lot of people, nobody's actually seen the drone. Um, there's more scares. Here we are. This this was um, online at the Independent, so it must be true. Uh, you have the great thing, of course, about air travel is that it brings everybody together on the planet, and we celebrate that. But it also brings all their diseases, and they all meet. Um, on the security trays. So next time you're flying through Norwich Airport or anywhere else, then do wash your hands after you've gone through security, please. Oh dear, oh dear. This is a historic um, Bureau de Change thing from about 2007. Within two years, the pound was down pretty much to one euro. And if you remember Vicky's uh, uh, slide of... Um, the the amount of inbound uh, amount of domestic tourism there was a surge in uh, 2009 which was when the pound was absolutely at its worst um, and also the kind of height of the recession however that most certainly didn't translate directly to a large number of uh, Europeans thinking great let's let's all go to uh, Norfolk because it's going to be dirt cheap um, and you simply because uh, that was the, the lowest point, 25.4 million was the uh, number of Europe, uh, overseas visitors to Britain in 2009, lowest in a decade. Oh dear. Um, there's other reasons why people will not be travelling abroad. Uh, of course, Paris always um, attractive, except when the gilets jaunes are in, in action. Or indeed, as you might remember this from uh, Saturday, somebody has decided to drape themselves in the St George's flag and stop all the trains for 12 hours. Um, they're even having big problems, which have been dra dragging on most of the time through March. Uh, on Eurostar travelling from uh, uh, Paris to London and they are now warning people not to try to travel in that direction for uh, another day or two. Um, and this is all going to get, uh, effectively, les douaniers, the French frontier officials, are pretending that Brexit's happened and there's been a no-deal Brexit and they're checking everybody's passports because a crucial thing is that at the moment, if you've got a valid British passport, you show up at any foreign frontier posts in the EU, they have to let you in. All they can do is check that it's your um, attractive uh, photograph um, and that the passport is valid. That's all they can do. Once we leave, it's going to be much more of, well, so what are you doing? Have you got, any, have you got enough money to do this? Who are you seeing? Um, how's your health? What work do you do? Have you been anywhere interesting uh, recently that we need to know about? So that is going to uh, slow things down. Um, then... Um, I genuinely don't know about climate change, but I do know that the uh, average uh, summer storms across Europe, this is just one day in August last year, are getting worse. Very exciting flying over to uh, Greece on that day. And the number of natural hazards. Who would have thought we would all be able to say, Eia fiatia yukut? There we are. You can possibly remember where you were when that time. <laughs> <laughs> Icelandic volcano <laughs> erupted. Oh dear, um, yes. Uh, I was actually um, in Norway uh, being an influencer on a um, skiing holiday. I went out as a passenger on SAS and I came back as French on a container ship. Um, and just so you know, anybody want to guess where this is? No, it's not Ipswich. Naples, very good. And what's the volcano in the background? Vesuvius, I heard a bit of sibilance there, yes, 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 Vesuvius, which, just so you know, um, so you can be prepared, uh, is going to pop quite soon. It's about 10 to 15 years past its normal cycle of eruptions, so when it does pop, it's going to be quite exciting. Um, and uh, so it'd be nice to have some plans in place. Ah, 
Therefore, people are going to be spending perhaps more time in the UK, uh, particularly if Brexit means that the pound um, slumps, as it certainly will do in the event of a no-deal Brexit, and it may do in the event of a softer Brexit. But there is still much work to be done, I think, in the uh, UK travel industry. So, for example, this is a uh, lovely... Um, eating opportunity in Glasgow. Um, down in Brighton, there's uh, some fast food opportunities. And over in Abergavenny, there we have another great dining opportunity. Um, but it goes more widely than that, and it's all about mindset. And I think you will possibly agree with me that um, tourism has never, by any government, been accorded the importance that it's economic and social value has. Uh, but look, poor old Goodwood, historic house, racetrack, um, everything. Uh, couldn't even get top billing to get the credit room and the amenity tip. Um, similarly in Dover, which has a great deal to commend it. So the less than half the government. Four, but no, the Immigration Removal Centre is the chief attraction there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Essex. And then, oh, look at this. So, who's been to Woodhall Spa? Fantastic. It's a Victorian spa town in Lincolnshire. It's the home of 617 Squadron, the Dam Busters. Uh, it's a wonderful place, but you wouldn't know it from the uh, 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 greeting that you get when you go in, which tells you two things. First of all, that uh, it's twinned with somewhere in France you've never heard of, and therefore isn't important. Um, if it's twinned with Las Vegas, put it on your sign. Um, but, uh, and also, it's been downhill since 1998. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you've got to do better than that. You've got to do <laughs> This was in Bex Hill in Sussex. Thankfully, a long way away from um, uh, Norfolk and other uh, Norwich, other great cities. So it wouldn't happen here. Anybody know where this is? Manchester. Manchester. Do you know what it is? Beetham Tower. Sorry. Beetham Tower. Yeah, and, and, and um, there's, a, there's a hotel there. Remember the case? Hilton. The Hilton. Um, well, let's, let's see if we can get a bit closer. Uh, oh, can we get? Oh no, it's the hill toe! for <laughs> <laughs> six weeks. Absolutely shameful. There we are. Um, and uh, just to give you some idea of how the welcome, not here, this magnificent place needs to be um, improved. This is a uh, uh, hotel. I won't tell you which one. It's in Scotland. All I will tell you is it's um, uh, named after a, uh, a former place of worship, and it's right next to Driver Abbey. Um, so I went to stay there, lovely part of the world. Anybody from the borders here? Fantastic. Um, so my first uh, night, my wife and I ordered a bottle of um, Sauvignon Blanc. Very nice too. We drank half of it. We were staying a couple of nights, so we said, can you keep the rest for us tomorrow? And tomorrow night, they said, um, oh, we can't find the, um, uh, the, the wine. Um, and I assumed, of course, they'd just give us a new bottle. So they did give us a new bottle, and they said, don't drink any more than you drank last night. <laughs> <laughs> and at breakfast, the following day, I went to breakfast. I ordered a full Scottish breakfast and brown toast. The toast arrived. It was white. So being English, I said, terribly sorry, I ordered brown toast. And she looked at it very sternly and said, that's not what it says on my chitty. So um, luckily, luckily, nowhere in um, uh, Norfolk would have that um, uh, that view. Um, this is, I think, still the prevalent idea in a lot of places. So, what's going on in terms of, um, of competition? Well, where is this, everybody? Very good. Ooh, crikey. Okay. What's significant about 2021? Oh, that's very good. Crikey. Well done. Yes, UK City of Culture, uh, which means there's going to be lots of attention on Coventry and its uh, interesting ecclesiastical and history and all kinds of other uh, things, so that people won't be going there. 
Um, where's this then? Go on. Liverpool. Oh, you're on fire today. Um, and what's interesting about Liverpool is that they have just, on the Association of, of Leading Visitor Attractions, uh, they have absolutely topped the charts in terms of the fastest growth of attractions and of visits to attractions. So uh, they're doing very well indeed. And there's other stuff happening. I'm not going to give you any prizes for um, uh, guessing that this is uh, uh, Jarrell Bridge. No, it's, um, uh, of course, the fourth rail bridge. And look, something really exciting is going to be happening quite soon. Uh, they are building, anybody been to Sydney and gone on the Sydney Harbour Prime? Great, okay, it's terrific. They're going to do the same thing on the fourth bridge. You can just see where, that, where, where you're going to be walking. That is going to get even more people to Edinburgh than go there at the moment um, and uh, it's going to attract people away. I don't think anybody's going to get this unless you've been um, following uh, the independent with more than the usual scrutiny. Anybody want to guess? Ah, well it's Eden Project North in Morecambe. And the Eden Project people from Cornwall, who I think one would have to agree, have been incredibly good at uh, attracting uh, more and more people to Cornwall and crucially uh, spreading the seasonality as well. They are going to do exactly the same thing, well, not exactly the same thing, but these are all, um, this is an artist's impression of what it will be like when it opens in about 2021 and people will be going to Morecambe and the uh, lovely adjoining city of Lancaster uh, quite a lot then I imagine so you've got to get people to Norwich and um, some of you I think will know uh, that we'll, we'll fly out of Norwich airport even though um, uh, you have to pay £10 for the privilege uh, which, uh, which I always find slightly annoying. It's important, however, given that Norwich is significantly dependent on Flybee for me, just to tell you what's happening in terms of Flybee's future. Um, as you will know, it is uh, right now being taken over by a consorti consortium of Virgin Atlantic, who basically want to put Virgin Atlantic all over their planes. Um, Stobart Air, which is um, uh, a South End based uh, organisation, and a US hedge fund which wants to make the loads of money. Um, and they're going to do that by shrinking to success. That's the idea. Now, uh, if you did have to read uh, the independent, my story about it, you will see. Look at that. Airports such as Cardiff and New Norwich, heavily dependent on flying, that outside its central core will be concerned. Um, of course, Stansted isn't too far away, and uh, it may be that Norwich is disadvantaged because they're. Flybee seems to be settling down into a kind of dual business model. One is the central core from Glasgow, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, through Manchester, uh, Birmingham, Southampton and Exeter. And the other one is building up an extraordinary portfolio of slots at Heathrow by various legal but possibly devious means um, so that they can, uh, they can flog them at the appropriate time. And that's possibly um, Virgin Atlantic's interest. But neither of those business models particularly includes Heathrow. Uh, it uh, includes Norwich. And no, no, once again, it's only Stuart and I can remember when you could fly from Norwich to Heathrow. And there is talk when there is a third runway uh, that Norwich would have a connection once again. It's 111 miles, but as you will know, it's not the easiest of drives, and certainly inbound tourists most definitely uh, like to be able to step off an aircraft and onto another one. Um, so tricky are the connections, at least according to, would you believe it, Lonely Planet, this is the Great Britain guy, guy where they don't appear to know about the railway. Obviously <laughs> <laughs> they don't. Um, quite extraordinary. Uh, I mean, I know that in the, uh, was it the 1980s, the What's the same? Of course, uh, Norwich cut off, uh, sorry, East Anglia cut off on three sides by the sea and on the fourth by British Rail. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is a bit much. There we are, lovely <coughs> Norwich station. 
and we were hearing about Norwich in 90 and yes you were kind of both right it is coming up look at that um, uh, it, that, that's what's happening on two trains a day from late May. Uh, it's a shame about the Ipswich stop, but you can't have everything. And that is actually, assuming they can get it to work, and you might remember the uh, timetable changes last May, which didn't go brilliantly. Uh, this is uh, also Chris Grayling's idea. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it is absolutely essential if you are going to attract people from London. And I'm sorry, of course there's more cities, but if you look at two hour travel time by train, you can, if you're not going to London from here, you can get to lovely Grantham in uh, uh, two hours, no further. You can't get to Nottingham, even though of course there are opportunities for Nottingham and Norwich to be tied together. Um, you can get to Peterborough and that's more or less it. So you've got to focus on London, not least because this is not quite true, but it's getting there. Nobody in London has a car anymore. Uh, the roads are so terrible, the congestion charge is lousy, uh, there's nowhere to park, um, and public transport has improved. So therefore, uh, people are less likely to have a car, and therefore they want to go somewhere lovely that they can reach easily. <coughs> and even though it is only two, uh, two trains a day for Norwich in 90, um, it's worth doing. And look, I am so enthused about Norwich City of Stories. Isn't that a lovely sign, isn't it? Oh, please, oh, please, let this be spring, because it suits the city very well indeed. Um, I loved also the reference to Julian of Norwich. I bet if you asked 100 people in London, 99 of them would assume he was a chap. But, um, of course, she wasn't. And my goodness me, this is maybe something to, to make you feel better about uh, uh, the consequences of Brexit. There we are. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be exceeding well. Um, but the whole story of her living in a cell um, and being the first published English language writer, uh, quite a remarkable story. Um, that's all very, very good to know about. Norwich Cathedral is most definitely uh, one of the most welcoming places of worship, I think, in the UK, and to its tremendous cre credit, because some of them, as you may know from your own experience, are not. And uh, the prospect of getting a uh, dinosaur, which is going to, this is then the Victoria and Albert uh, um, in London, and of course, Dippy is going to be going on tour and I think Norwich Cathedral is the last stop and it's going to be so exciting where we're going to. And the Sainsbury Centre. Now uh, I regard this honestly as one of the most exciting places for uh, culture, um, dare I say it, outside London. But I'm not quite sure how well joined up it is to the city in the eyes of people who are coming to Norfolk. Uh, well okay. worth going to. And there's some really nice individual things going on. I like St Andrew's Brewery Tour. I like the idea that I'm getting uh, two possible choices for uh, my tour of the brewery. Uh, and that's, that's all very, very good, very well focused. And of course, at this very place, Richard Hughes, who I think is, um, is uh, around today, um, the cookery program, great places to stay here. And what a wonderful story of, um, of, of just reconstruction of what I think was called a Grand Village Hall. It's a lovely opportunity. Now, one quick thing before we get on to the twins, which I'm looking forward to hugely. Um, I think we might have an interesting discussion about why somewhere in the Philippines has come up with a cocktail called the Influencer. Well, that is because they are reacting against people possibly like me. Here we are, White Banana Beach. Um, this is what uh, triggered it all. This went viral. I don't know if you saw it. Um, we would like to announce that White Banana is not interested to collaborate with self-proclaimed influencers and we suggest you try another way to eat, drink, or sleep, or fruit, or try to actually work. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, um, I think it's time that you were uh,
foot right about thing or two. But we have, if you can bear with us, uh, going to have a, um, a panel session after this, in which case you can heckle and ask lots of difficult questions. <laughs> Meanwhile, back to you, Stuart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and as he says, he'll be back for the uh, session a little bit later on. But actually, in the next part, it's going to be talk and questions at the same time. And I'm not going to interfere. They're going to take their own questions. So please welcome vloggers, bloggers, influencers, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the twins that travel. So with our family until we were about 17. And then I don't think I travelled for seven years or eight years, and it wasn't something I was particularly interested in either, mainly because I didn't have any money. Um, we are the millennial generation. Um, and then something happened, and social media came out. Yeah, I think growing up for us, we consumed uh, travel media in the most traditional ways. I'm watching Michael Payne to Europe with my dad, or I remember reading the likes of Simon Holder uh, and print. Um, but that was largely it. I mean, for me, travel was either um, Michael Palin, it was the face of Michael Palin, or it was an 18 year going on a gap year, which I didn't have. I didn't really feel that I fitted in either of those groups. Um, travel for me just wasn't a lifestyle, it wasn't particularly accessible. Um, but then came social media and Instagram in particular. And we discovered a girl called Wada Wonderlust, who's called Brooke. And when we found her, she thinks she was 20 at the time, and we presumed she was a rich kid being paid by her parents, surely, to travel the world in five-star luxury. But there was something about her story that we, we loved, and the fact that she wasn't being paid, she, was, she wasn't being sent by her parents. She was being paid by choice boards to produce content for her 603,000 followers. And I think this is a turning point for me, because suddenly travel was very accessible. Travel was now a girl, it was my age. Um, she interacted with me, I could ask her questions, I could comment on photographs, I could ask her questions about where she was. And she replied, and she suddenly made uh, trouble for me seeing something that I could do that was similar. Well, I was about 26 by this point, a 26 year old. I had to have my lifestyle. Um, and I think for us that was really the turning point when travel became something that was completely um, like a pain esque to something that was a 22 year old Australian. Yeah, and discovered on social media. So we made the grammatically incorrect twins that travel, we don't we know. <laughs> um, our dad reminds us every day, but TTT is a nice iteration, and someone once said that TWT reminded us something else. So yeah. um, <laughs> we're happy to keep TTT. So we, we launched in July 2014, so nearly yes. five years ago. We were both working at the Open University. It was one Friday lunchtime. We gave five minutes thought to it, and we opened up the grammatically incorrect uh, Instagram account. Um, but we amassed about 50,000 followers in three years. Not yeah. too bad. Yeah. Um, at the time, um, we tried an algorithm that plays a lot of social media managers had come into play. So Instagram, it was very easy to grow our following. Ours was predominantly women um, between 25 and 35, UK and US based. Um, and then off the back of that, 
we decided to supplement it yeah. with an actual blog going to content. Yeah. Uh, so surprisingly, some influencers can write, and um, we really enjoy writing. We both wrote for our jobs professionally. We're working full time until two years ago, so this was just a hobby. We launched the blog as a complete hobby to tell stories. We weren't interested in top 10 places to eat in London or the most Instagram spots. We wanted to tell proper stories, stories about our travels, the people that we met, and perhaps that's what sets us apart slightly to the other influences that you hear about so much. I think the story about the monoscopy also sets us apart quite early on when I went to Marrakesh, which helped things yeah. along. And then after that, we were fortunate enough to win a handful of awards at Cosmopolitan Visit USA, and we began to write Global Planet Pathfinders. Um, we won some internal awards with Blogosphere, um, so we continued writing. I did some courses at the University for Photography, um, and we just continued to try and improve upon ourselves. And this is uh, one example of us in Norwich, which we'll touch upon. Um, <coughs> yes, it's some examples of our photography, so not <coughs> selfies, we're not interested in taking pictures on our phone. We shoot on DSLR, it was very good. Um, so, yeah. And then in 2016, I'd say there was a turning point. Um, until 2016, we'd been working entirely for free. We had been, I was working in fundraising, Claire was a marketeer, and um, we were just doing this at weekends and in evenings. Um, and in 2016, I think there was a gold rush in social media marketing. Um, and all of a sudden, um, we were being invited on press trips alongside the likes of people like Simon and journalists um, to go along and document uh, these destinations um, for a paid fee. Um, and so prior to that, we've been working for three years uh, for free, and now it's sort of, there was just a turning point, and um, Claire then was brave enough to take the first step in her job. I think Laura let me leave first in case I feel unemployed. Yeah, yeah, so I just monitored the situation, and then about a year later, I, yeah, took I then, yeah, so, yeah, so in 2016, we began to work with tours and boards, airlines, destinations, and brands. And these are just some examples of the ones we worked with in the last nine months, so yeah. Just a few. We also work with um, lifestyle and consumer brands, so as soon as we finish here, we're off to Northumberland to work with Barber for a three-day shoot, and we're working with BMW next week. Um, so, why has all this happened? Well, it's been the gold rush of social media. Whether you like it or not, if you hate it, if you're not on it, it's happening, it's in our generation, we're growing up with it, your children are growing up with it. So, it's happening. And there's one stat that blows my mind. I wondered if anyone, when anyone wanted to guess how many videos and photos are shared on Instagram every single day. Anyone? Go on. <laughs> Don't be shy. 20 million. Nope. More. It's 95 million every single day. So that beats any newspaper circulation, anything you can think of at the moment. Whether it's right or wrong, that's what's happening. And 500 million users on Instagram every single day. 500 million people are logging into one app to consume content every single day. There's nothing parallel to that at, that moment, at the moment, really. And at least 38% of that content is travel-based as well. So to consume travel these days, Instagram is a key um, medium by the which to do that. Um, but more than that, so say you work with Simon, you work with the Independent, you have your traditional printing, which I'm completely advocate for, um, you have your television in, then social media offers you the chance to reach a whole new audience, whether that's millennials, Gen, Gen Z, or actually even older. Um, our second largest audience is 45 to 55, actually. Um, so not only does it give you a new reach, a new audience, it gives you better tangible ROI. So when working, oh, sorry. Oh, so when working um, via Instagram, for example, you can actually glean how many people engaged Let's say, for example, Norwich asked us to post a photo for them, so we post a photograph. And two weeks later, Norwich said, How did it do? So we can say how many people liked it, engaged with it, how many people saved it, how many people sent it to their friends, the comments, the impressions, and the scale. So if you were to put it in a magazine, for example, say the magazine has a circulation of 100,000, that's fantastic. But past that, you have no real indication of what happens then. You don't know whether people engage with it, um, whether people save it, or if they even you know, look at it. Social media therefore provides these metrics that I think are super useful for destinations. Yeah, uh, coming as a marketing manager previous to becoming a lazy influencer, and um, I, yeah, the, it's, it, it's crazy to think you can measure, you, can, you know you're going to put £10 into something and you can see exactly what you've got back. And that is the reason why brands, tourism boards, airlines across the world are investing in social media and people with audiences on social media.
Um, just lastly, we also have a podcast called Twin Perspectives, which is mainly just rambling for an hour or so. But that's conversations about the destinations that we've been to. Um, we've just hit over 100,000 downloads on that. So um, podcasts, without a doubt, are one of the, the biggest trends at the moment. If, you haven't run a, if you're not running a podcast and it makes sense for your business to run a podcast, run a podcast. Uh, super easy to do. You just need a microphone, really. Um, and we also have just launched Twins of Travel Tours, which is sustainable women tours. Uh, we've just gone to Morocco and we focus on women-led initiatives when we're in a country. So we're now going from online, for, ironically, offline, and we're taking women from all over the world to join us on tours. Uh, we're doing Turkey in September. Which is Twins of Travel Tours to Turkey, which is Twins of Travel Tours to Turkey. And we need some rebranding. And we are off to Georgia and Iran next year. So anyway, how all this can help you? Um, so, Collect Time helps us to put together some lessons that we learned along the way. Um, and there's sort of three main lessons, I guess, that we've sort of come across. Um, one, I think, applies to any, any sector, any job, any field, is um, quality prevails. And I don't want to kind of fall onto that narrative as well. First, to put out into the media about kind of this um, poor quality, money grabbing blogger and all these scandals that surround blogging, um, because they do. Um, but likewise, any sector does, especially in the sector. And just as Simon would have been involved in a phone hacking scandal, not that I know of, not every influencer wants a freebie. Um, it's a really new field, so it's to be expected there's a proliferation of people coming into it and wanting to have a go. Um, but over the last few years, it's beginning to settle with those that have given up, sort of falling away, and those that really want to do it for a living, rising to the top. Um, so from early on, we um, decided that this is going to be our profession, even when it wasn't. Um, much to Claire's dismay, I proofread everything she writes, and critique it, and um, likewise, she does that back. Um, so I always decided this is a profession. If anyone's reading it, it could be my boss, it could be the CEO of British Airways, it could be my dad, which is the most terrifying for. Um, so to keep the quality there. And so we, we, I think we've been recognised for that. Um, we were most recently uh, uh, featured by the BBC. Um, it was a twin angle, to be fair. So, I mean, the twin. Yeah. The twins. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, my, our brother actually has brunette hair, and um, someone thought we, we were the, his sisters were the top left. I said, like, wow, they're beautiful. And then they just said, no, it's actually this one's there. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, and we've got a uh, feature by BBC, which I think is a sign that of um, perhaps that we, we have focused on quality all along. And you know, we're building a business, we're self-employed now, we can't not we can't be slack, we can't make yeah. poor decisions. This is a business whether people understand that or not. So um, yeah, quality prevails in the blogging business. Yeah, and likewise, I mean these are um, I guess colleagues of us, aren't they? Generally they also worked in England on the ambassadorship as we did last year. Um, they work seven days a week, 22 hours a day, they're absolutely incredible. Um, um, last month they hit 1.2 million hits on their web page in one month. So yeah. again, they are rivaling national newspapers. Yeah, uh, newspapers. and they are of an incredible quality. Um, so yes, quality, quality prevails, I think we found earlier on. Secondly, authentic, authenticity is key. So there are so many people trying to do, you know, they're, depressingly there probably are teenagers growing up wanting to be these YouTube sensations and there's a very much a copycat culture but we kind of realised earlier on that if we want to be successful we have to tell our story and not try to be <coughs> girls in ball gowns in the middle of New York getting run over or there's girls in ball gowns at the top of mountains and I just don't understand how they got there or how they got their dress there. I saw once a girl doing an ad for a mattress and the mattress was on top of a mountain and still to this day just don't understand how <laughs> she got... Was it? <laughs> <laughs> I like to think she was just lugging it up the mountain. Um, but we weren't interested in any of that. Um, in fact, we have both really suffered from anxiety and depression growing up, um, which is one of the reasons why we couldn't travel. We couldn't get around Tesco supermarket without having a panic attack. Um, and we've always already told that story. We tell it with mind all the time. And I think that's how we found our following, I guess, of people who resonate with our story, that you can travel... You can be crying as you get on a plane and absolutely terrified of flying, but you can still get there. You don't need to be a really confident traveller in order to see the world. In fact, you can be terrified most of the time and, and travel, and it makes your world bigger. I think for us, travel is definitely our therapy in keeping our world bigger. And I think by being authentic, as uncomfortable as that is sometimes, and like much to the dismay of our dad that we keep telling our story like this, um, it works because 
we're not trying to be someone we're not, which we are just nervous travellers. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, trying to stay, and also that means that our audience tends to stick with us longer and at least believes what we say or takes our recommendations to heart or implements our recommendations. Um, you know, if I was selling, you know, flat tummy tea all the time, you know, I think my audience might disappear eventually. So it's also about choice of who we work with and only working with people that I feel sort of fits with us. Um, also realising it's not about you, um, we're travel bloggers, people aren't interested in what we're wearing or what we look like, um, they're interested in the places that we're visiting, so all of our photos mainly just focus on the landscape and not us, we're not interested in showcasing ourselves too much. Third okay, so audience and client comes first. Um, again, so the narrative of an artistic blogger, you know, we spend all our time thinking about ourselves and what filters will look best in us. Actually, for most bloggers, client or oh, audience, sorry, comes first. So um, when thinking about the photographs we take, the articles we write, the podcast we record, anything we do, we have our audience in mind of what they like. Our audience love going to central British village, for example. They love Britain, and a lot of them are Americans. So this drives a lot of the content that we do. And I have to constantly think when I'm doing photographs and captions or writing an article, is this going to engage the audience? Will they like it? Will they stay with us after this? So it's not actually anything to do with me. I have to think all the time about our audience. Um, you know, and they're for a fickle bunch, you know, on You can't follow someone just like that if you upset them. So we have to think really carefully about what we do. So actually, I think if I posted 100 photographs of us smiling gorgeously, they would be gone. So um, audience is actually a part of the thing. And I think that means we turn down a lot of things. So I think if we went on a private jet to Dubai and stayed in a six-star hotel, our audience can't afford that. They're never going to be able to do that and we'd alienate them. So we have to turn down things that we think wouldn't be a fit with our audience. So mainly we just stay in the UK um, within an hour from home. <laughs> but if that's what works, and that's what works for our audience, because ultimately they're the ones who give us our jobs. Yeah. And then client comes first. So um, we now, this is now a full-time job for us. So we, anyone we work with we see as a client. And ultimately, their aims, their objectives, their expectations, their deliverables are what we have to hold and put first, really. Um, and so when we're working, we always want to go above and beyond. So when we working visit England, for example, we then do some podcasts. We want to do some vlogs as well. Um, so we want to produce more than just the three uh, articles I think we needed to write. Um, and I, you know, kind of fight almost constantly on every single trip because we are so stressed about getting the right deliverables for the client. Um, so it's not always particularly fun, um, but we get through it. But then that also means, I think, being able to challenge a client. Um, so thinking about the visit England, it was a fantastic year as ambassadors. But a lot of the trips involved going to museums, um, quite dark, murky museums, which was interesting. Um, when it came to sort of representing on Instagram, they just weren't particularly engaging or appealing. So we had to have a conversation with Visit England and said to best represent Norwich, for example, you know, could we go into the lanes instead of the museum and represent it that way? Um, and so I think when working with a client, it's also having um, the confidence to suggest that what they're suggesting might not work with your audience, um, because ultimately you want them to benefit um, as much as you do. <laughs> Yeah, we, we said back to visit England, there were we love museums and we were really interested in them. You know, we've got to do deliverables on Instagram, so we need places we can photograph. So we went to Northampton, where we're headed to this afternoon. I think this photo got three and a half thousand saves, so not likes, saves. We were saving that as an idea of where to go. Um, and then we went to Margate and to Dreamland, the really cool retro theme park there, and that captured so many imaginations. Um, this concept of a micro-adventure, you can go to these places on a weekend, you don't need a car, you can get there. Um, yeah, so it's feeding back to visit England, basically, remember what our job is. We love museums, but we can't photograph them. So take us to places we can photograph and we can say a destination that way. And how the landscape, well, the landscape of travel is changing, um, and changing it is. So I think the first one, and again, I mean, this might trigger a few eye rolls, but Travel is now an aesthetic, so how we consume travel particularly isn't perhaps why reading a long paragraph or a long article even. It really is a visual representation, often within a very small box on Instagram. And people aren't travelling necessarily now because they've read you know, a great summary of a place, they've seen a particular picture and they've saved it, and they are travelling to get that picture and recreate the experience that they've been sold. Um, and the aesthetic behind travel now is so important. Um, and then you only have to look at people like uh, Beautiful Destinations, I think it's Instagram's biggest travel account. 
Yes, so these were their social media launch, and we did. They have 12 million followers. They're now employed by tourism boards all over the world to create the most beautiful content through videos and drones, and people are getting their ideas of where to go on holiday through this one profile. They're not going on buying those glossy Thomas Cook magazines anymore and leaking them through um, and you know, looking at villains' holidays. They're looking at beautiful destinations accounts and they're buying consuming video um, and looking at where they want to go to Instagram basically. Whether that's depressing or not, that is what's happening unfortunately. Um, but on the positive side, lots of businesses are harnessing this aesthetic drive towards travel. Um, Peggy Porsche in London, I did see an interview with her recently, um, who regrets this decision because her business went viral and now she's sort of um, swamped in influences. But so this, is, this is Peggy Porsche in London. Yeah, she effectively set about to make her cafe as aesthetically pleasing and Instagramable as possible. Um, and I've seen it all over London, I've seen it in Manchester and Leeds drive to put whether a flower wall in or something where people go and take that photograph. Um, we were in Los Angeles, they had it everywhere there as well. So it's kind of putting in and thinking about this aesthetic drive um, and how you can only do more cues of people outside your business perhaps taking selfies, but how you can um, bring together the trends with your own business. Um, I understand that is a depressing thing to say, even as you were saying that. It is depressing, but it's this generation of people who are looking to document their lives online, and if there's a pretty place to take a photo, they're going to go there. So unfortunately, Peggy probably isn't getting all of her sales from her cake. She's getting her sales from her beautiful front door, basically. But it drives business still it's, football, isn't it's it? driving business. Yeah. Um, but travel is also about experiences and niche experiences. So these are the bubble, bubble, lakes. bubble lakes of Alberta. Probably not many people knew about these, and Alberta in the winter is minus 35. So it's not an obvious place to want to go on holiday in the middle of winter, but then suddenly Alberta tourism went viral, and there was pictures of these bubble lakes where the, obviously the, the water's frozen, it's captured the gas in the water. Um, and people are now rooting out these experiences online and then wanting to go and recreate them. Um, whether it's a hot air balloon over Cappadocia, um, we did a, 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 bit, a sunset camel ride through the Agafé Desert in Morocco a few weeks ago, and people are captured by these small experiences now. It's not so much about wanting to lay by a pool with a book. They're obsessed with buying into these sort of experiences, um, particularly sustainable uh, tourism as well. We'll get onto that with our tours. Um, but there's definitely a trend now to wanting to experience something particular. Of course, this is leading to over-tourism. You've got um, visit um, Iceland and Faroe Islands that did such an amazing job at their blogger and journalist uh, PR that they're now overrun. And Faroe Islands, I think, have stopped doing any press at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And same with Iceland. And so over-tourism is a problem, but I was listening to a really interesting podcast with Lonely Planet. And they're saying that they see sustainable, a wave of sustainable tourism coming in. And we see that happening. We put it in with our own tours. Women want to contribute to women in a country. We went to female-only cooking classes. We went to female-only run restaurants. And that's where the interest is in. And I think that will be a, definitely a trend in the next few years. And I think even when we came to Norwich, visit England and visit Norwich, we're very careful to put these little experiences in. So we picked up a picnic and we went down to the playhouse and had a picnic by the river and they gave us hot water bottles and a hot toddy. And it was all very sweet, very cute, this very small niche experience that then our followers could recreate and go and do themselves. So um, it was kind of these small things that we remember rather than the huge, big experiences perhaps you have, like a safari, for example. I think Laura summarised it with this quote, which, yeah, I, I guess you could really argue it's quite a depressing experience, but people are pinning images, they're saving photographs on social media, and they're creating where they want to go through this. They're not buying brochures anymore or reading a glossy magazine. They're putting together a very deliberate set of aesthetics of what they want to recreate when they're on holiday. Uh, the role of a good blogger in the tourism community. So what is the role of us in helping you guys? Um, well, first of all, before I see myself as a public service, so um, as I said, we didn't earn a penny for three or four years, but everywhere I went, I would take photographs and tweet about it, write about my experience, Instagram story my experience, because ultimately I wanted to share my experience so that other people could have ideas about where to go for the weekend or, you know, or feel brave enough to go somewhere. So even earlier, I mean, last night we arrived at this beautiful hotel, our room was gorgeous, um, just a few Instagram stories about it, um, because it was lovely. Um, people within Norwich said, I've only been there for opportunity, I'll have to come and stay. Whereas people outside Norwich were kind of bookmarking it. So I see myself really as a bit of a, a megaphone for wherever I am, just to say, it's like having a glass of wine with your friend and saying, oh, I've been to this great cafe the other day, oh, you know, and you a lovely cake. 
except I'm just doing it on that scale. Um, and I don't expect to be paid for it necessarily. Um, it's basically a friendly conversation scale times a few thousand is how I would see blogging. Yeah, and I think it's also about having an honest conversation. So not everything is always great when we travel, even though they're fresh trips and we're being paid. Just like a journalist, I would expect them to be honest. We have a role to play in being honest about our experiences. Not everything is great travel. Things go wrong all of the time. Um, and like we mentioned, we talk a lot about mental health, so we have very honest conversations online uh, because that's what uh, social media should be. It shouldn't be some pretend world of beautiful images. So I think we have a huge responsibility, even though we have a very modest audience size, we have a huge responsibility to be honest about our experiences. Blogging is not a quid pro quo relationship. Um, I don't want your money. Yeah, I don't expect if I'm coming to eat at your restaurant, for example, I, I should have it for free. Or if I am going to document, for example, this conference, then you should, you know, send me free accommodation here for the next 12 months. I am here because I need to create content for my audience. I want to create content that's engaging, but I don't expect anything back. And I think to think that every blog is something for something for free or for a fee, um, free or fee. Um, would be doing the blogging community to service. Um, I am happy to create content and get nothing in return because ultimately my audience engage with it and that keeps them on board for me, so that's really win for me. Um, so don't think if a blog approaches you, you need to throw money at them or a freebie. Um, if they are doing it because they love it, they should be happy to do it for free. Yeah. Um, a good blogger will engage with your needs and they'll ask three questions. So you should always have a brief ready. You should always already know what your deliverables are. So we'll say, okay, you want to take us to Florida, but what are your key messages? What is it we're trying to promote here? Uh, we should be asking, yeah, what are your deliverables? What is it exactly that you want from us? Do you want a blog post? Do you want social media posts? And that's usually set out in a very formal contract, just like any other business agreement. And what is the brief? So you've just opened up a restaurant in Norwich. You know, what is the brief that you want us to fulfill? Um, so a good blogger should be asking you those questions before they work with you. They shouldn't just be looking for a freebie, coming for some lunch and then disappearing and you never hear from them again. Uh, that's a telltale sign that they're yeah, probably after a freebie. But a uh, good blogger should be asking you questions before they come to your establishment. Yeah, and I think entering into a dialogue with whoever you're working with is hugely beneficial for both parties rather than, I'll come here, have a quick coffee and I'll go, that's free. Um, I think a narrative or any conversation you can have is beneficial. Um, and a good blogger will know their audience. Um, so if you do if you approach by a blogger, you should ask to see and ask their main stats and their audience. They might provide this via a media kit, for example. So, but they, they should know who they are. So they should be able to know their demographic, their ages, their interests. And this is important because, for example, say you had a beautiful restaurant, but it was quite expensive. I should be able to tell you that my following might not necessarily be able to afford that. But if you were doing a promotion 25% off or a free night or something, that's what I would like to promote to them. So, they really should know who's following them and be able to tell you that, otherwise it's, um, it's like you know, trying to find a needle in the haystack in terms of what can actually be a benefit to both of you. This is just an example of, uh, this is a screenshot from our media kit for our blog audience, so you can provide breakdown of female, uh, gender, country, um, and then we also have the same for our social media. So a good blogger should be able to provide you a media kit of all of their stats like that, um, so you can make sure that your audience their audience is correct for your audience and who you're trying to sell to. Yeah. And a good blogger will assist on integrity and authenticity. So I think we've been in a few situations where a destination or a brand has said, this is the message, you know, just passively regurgitate that. Um, and I don't think, you know, if you care about blogging, you'd be happy to do that. So a blogger should take on your key messaging, but feel that there's creative direction or freedom to be able to articulate that. And likewise, if something goes wrong, just because they're being paid, they should be able to say that something went wrong. Now, this is a really good example. That is she one of the most creative people on Instagram. She works with global brands every day, but she shoots everything in her own style. If Purcell tried to give her you know, a, a bottle and they tried to make a picture of it just on a washing machine and she put it up, it wouldn't work. They, you, as a brand, they have to hand over the creativity to that blogger. They know their audience best. They can create content. Um, so, yeah, authenticity is really important. We're not here just to regurgitate press releases. Um, we're here to write our own stories and create our own content. Okay, very quickly, uh, dispelling myths. Um, one, you don't need to work with every blogger. Um, I think your last uh, slide, Simon, showed that poor people were overwhelmed with asks. You know, you can ignore a large amount of them. You don't have to feel forced to even engage with them. 
that's perfectly fine. However, I would say there was an opportunity with working bloggers to don't be afraid to audit them. And by order, I mean ask for their media kit and you know, challenge them to show you previous pieces of work that have worked well with their lesson of the business. Um, engage in conversation and challenge them to actually demonstrate how they're going to be a benefit to you. Um, you can work more than one, one blogger once, so actually this is best. It's best to work with one blogger multiple times and lots of different bloggers all of the time because the messaging becomes very diluted. We only really work on ambassadorships now, which means we wouldn't, we would rarely just put up one post on, on a product or one place. We prefer to have ambassadorships, it works much better for us and for our client and the brand and the audience feel much more on board with it. They feel like, okay, this is a year-long ambassadorship, we're getting to know this brand. So yeah, you can work with a blogger more than once. Don't assume bloggers are less significant than traditional press. Yes, they might have a different audience, traditional press, but that audience is not insignificant and nor is it one you can ignore. Um, it's entirely legitimate and bloggers they have almost a frightening amount of influence and sway. I don't think we do, but some of the big ones really, really do. So, um, you know, they are of, of significance. Not all bloggers want freebies. <laughs> Um, for us, actually, I was saying to Laura, if someone offered me a free meal in return for lots of things, I'd rather just pay for it. Um, I'd rather enjoy my meal in peace. We're not all after freebies. This is our job now. Um, we don't just go after free things. Of course, there are people out there who are going to be like that, but um, yeah, not all bloggers want freebies. I would take a free car, though, if it came about. I was thinking about it, um, and don't assume you will know what works best. A blogger should, as I said before, be able to challenge you and say, I think that idea is a great idea, but for our audience, it should maybe perhaps we'll take this as they normally do it like this. So they should be able to find you. A blogger will not work like a journalist. Um, on a press trip with bloggers and journalists, it's always tense. Um, because we have so much usually to do. We're having to take photographs, we're also having to take notes, we're writing a blog post, we're running podcasts, we're having to do live stories on the go. We take a little bit longer than most people, that's because we're having to do, we're a one man band of lots of different things. Um, so we don't work in the same way, uh, we're not paid by a publication. That's the biggest thing. People say, well, I'm not, this journalist is coming on the press trip, but we're not paying him directly, why should we pay you? But we don't work for a publication, we work for ourselves, and the content is created onto the publication mm -hmm. that we own. So we work differently. And uh, micro bloggers can be just as effective. So, uh, by that, I mean bloggers are through the less than a thousand, although it's the criteria seems to flux. Um, small bloggers seem to have much better engagement because they are more intimately, they know their, their community better. Um, and so, if someone you know, approaches you less than 10,000, I think they're a great, um, a great advocate of, of your business. And the importance of tourism boards working with their local DMO, so how can they help you? So if you feel like, I really want to work with a blogger, but I just don't know what I'm doing, go to your DMO, they're going to be able to help you. Um, we worked with the Norwich DMO when we came to visit England, and they outsourced the DMO who helped work with us. Um, so they can help audit your blogger, they can work out whether your blogger is legitimate, um, they can look at the media kit for you, they can provide advice on how you can promote your business. They might be able to say, this girl is absolutely great at taking photos, so you know, use her in an Instagram capacity. Or this woman is amazing at writing, so maybe focus on a story about a night at the theatre, something like that. So they can advise you. Um, they can also help manage expectations on either side, which means that <coughs> neither party is left feeling you know, they've got their hands burnt by the experience. Um, they can also enter into professional and transactional conversation with the blogger, which saves you a lot of time. Um, also, afterwards, they can go and collect all the stats from you for, for the blogger and then report back to you. Um, and lastly, just help professionalise the entire thing, which again saves you any risk of getting harmed or hurt or, or losing any money from the entire thing. We're nearly there. Um, and we take away from working with bloggers. Yeah, um, one, recognise the incredible opportunity afforded by bloggers. Um, a lot of our photography is bought now by tourism boards for offline and online print. And although we're paid, we're probably paid uh, much less than how much it would cost to buy and bring a professional film crew and photographer out to a destination. We, yes, we're paid, but it, we're still a great affordable option for people um, looking to get their, their name out there. I don't know why I put that in. No, exactly. It's just a pretty picture. Um, uh, quality counts. Again, don't, be, um, don't think you have to work with every blogger and don't feel afraid to say the quality is not good enough here for my business. That's absolutely fine. Three, develop relationships. We talked about ambassadorships. At least have a conversation with a blogger you like. If they've done well, develop that relationship. 
things. Uh, we are ambassadors for Victrinox, which are a travel suitcase brand and watch brand. And we take their stuff all over the world. I think we're nearly a year into ambassadorship now. We basically take their stuff all over the world. So we were in uh, teams in France earlier this year. Then we took their watches to Finland. Um, so it's been a really, it's been a nearly a year long ambassadorship with them now. Our audience expects their messaging, and uh, yeah, I think it's working really well. And lastly, but I've got some came in 2017. Um, so just reflect on what we've talked about in their travels now, bite size and local. It's a lifestyle, it's something people want to experience on Sunday afternoon, not two weeks in July. Um, the travel is also aesthetic, it's like beautiful places that can be captured and recaptured and recaptured over and over and over again. And people want experiences, these niche experiences. And I think when we used to Norwich now, um, maybe two years ago, my first thought was that Norwich takes all of these boxes over and over and over again. Um, and whereas towns such as Rye or the Cotswolds have kind of clambered onto this and they're very prolific across Instagram, I've never seen Norwich or these pictures shared at such an extent that these other towns have. So my thought was that this was a hidden gem that I think is exciting because I think it's at the very start of harnessing social media. You know, a lot of people have already done it to death now, for a while in Iceland. Um, but for Norwich, I think you take all three boxes of these, these future social media trends and travel, um, and it's a great opportunity to harness them. I think as Simon was saying, we had a focus on micro-adventures, and this is a perfect example of, for London, um, uh, finishing on a Friday, catching the train, coming to Norwich, having a weekend to get the train back. They're the type of trips now that our generation have time for and we can afford. Um, so I think it worked really, really well in terms of documenting it as a micro-adventure destination. We also say that's an example of the blog. But overall, we have so far 55,000 leads on the Norwich blog. It's read every day because our website ranks well, so anytime someone searched what, what to do in Norwich, I think, it comes up on the first page of Google, so it's read all of the time. It's evergreen content, always being searched. 8,500 listeners to the podcast so far, and overall on the Instagram images we did put up, it had a reach of 105,000. So, not a mate, not, not as big as huge bloggers, Sorry. but it's all right. <laughs> not too bad. Um, the end. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Yes, Simon, go on. Oh, Simon. Uh, thank you very much indeed, there, Laura. Um, now, uh, I have um, nearly 2,000 followers on Instagram, you have over 60,000. So I'm going to ask the people, and probably on behalf of everyone here, how do people find you? How do they find us? Yes. I think the main thing we did very early on was try and get our photographs featured by big accounts who were just a leader for us. They have a huge audience. Beauty Destinations um, embarked on sort of an unofficial ambassadorship with us for the first year we were on Instagram, and they featured us every month. Um, and I would say wholly, especially now with the algorithm changes, get your stuff onto other people's accounts. And that's travel accounts, that's travel and leisure, beautiful destinations, all these living planet, planet, we can offer to you, you know, approach living planet and say, hey, can I do a takeover? Um, and I think really now, with the algorithm, that's the most realistic chance for growth. The only other thing, oh, it's much louder than the other The only other thing that we found is traditional press guides people. So when we were featured by the BBC, we went up hugely, and we're going to we're going into the sun this week. Um, we're not on page three. Um, so traditional press still has a, a big part to play, uh, but really it's just seek out features, seek out features from other larger brands um, or pages. Any other questions? You have to get to Northumberland. We do. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sometimes I feel so old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to bring Richard down here now. Um, Richard Hughes from the Assembly House and Richard Hughes, Cookery School and Simon. Can you come? back up as well and we'll do uh, some questions and answers that'll wrap us up today you're doing a vegan a vegan course now yeah. isn't it? yes yeah. man. Any, anything to bring me. 
Yeah. Stuart, just, just while we're, we're getting set up, can I just say, um, uh, Claire and Laura are absolutely right about podcasts. And guess what? If you've got one of these, do you mind if I just pick this up? This is a Zoom. I'm not sure it's Thank you. Claire and Laura use. But um, with one of these... You can record high-quality podcasts. You can find lots of audio editing software on the uh, on online. And the best way to get a good sound, although it looks and sound uh, it looks weird, and when I say it, it sounds weird, is put a duvet on your head. Seriously, uh, that way you're going to dedicate it to uh, Stuart's excellent um, uh, BBC quality standards. There we go. <laughs> right, here we go. Some questions to Simon and to Richard. Um, just, I mean, culinary. I, I did mention the market and its delight yeah. of foods, but but we're pretty good, aren't we? For yeah, I think we're. You know, I think we're, we're certainly a hundred percent better than we we ever have been. And if I go back 15, 20 years ago, you know, we had a taste of Cornwall and Scotland was incredible in um, promoting themselves, and we've sort of come late to the party as we as we mostly do on a lot of things, but. Uh, Things like the Proudly Norfolk scheme and things like that are, are, are still shouting. I do think they shout, they're, they're quite insular, you know, I have to be careful because I'm a patron of the Norfolk Food Festival. Well, I think a lot of the time they're preaching to the convert and I think you could do far more to push it out to other people. What is, what is the, the taste of Norfolk? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I have to be very careful. Yeah, see, I um, invariably it's things that are produced in Norfolk, but to be honest with you, the Proudly Norfolk scheme covers things like olive oil and olives and all these things which are quite clearly not uh, not grown here but if 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 they have Norfolk people involved that's what they what they count on. I mean, there are obviously foods that are absolutely iconic to, to the county uh, but I think it's more about a, a movement to get people in as much as you know trying to sell what we've got right and our strawberries are among the best of them well I'm a fan boy so uh, yeah, yeah. yeah some of mine go into the uh, Cambridgeshire, so I've been careful. <laughs> so, you wanted to say? Oh, all I was going to say was, sorry, we're talking about food so close to lunch. <laughs> yes, yes. Do we have any questions to Simon or to Richard? Yes. Uh, uh, Caroline Gerald, um, a question for Simon, really. Can you give us one or two things, two areas where you think Norwich has really been missing out on talking itself up? Uh, well, talking yourself up in such a crowded marketplace is always going to be difficult. Um, I, su- I suppose, well, let's go back to football. I think that is so important. And in, having a Premier League side, in terms of world visibility, is absolutely crucial. Simply because uh, so many uh, people who travel the world, they're watching the English Premier League and they know all the uh, all the, the teams and obviously Manchester does fantastically well because they've got a couple of uh, football teams there and um, and, and uh, they, they probably do better than their, their kind of touristic value would would suggest so uh, certainly yeah just just um, if you can the Premier League that would be ideal if you just organise that um, I, I, honestly it is access that is the crucial thing um, you know, people will in in, 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 in uh, the West, in West Yorkshire and so on will have uh, recollections of spending three days getting to Norfolk um, because the roads have not been great. And uh, obviously, anybody who travels by train, anybody who tries to travel from here to London by train on a Sunday, <laughs> has been engineering work. Actually, um, I think uh, since well throughout the 21st century in terms of my trying to get to Norwich on a Sunday, it does, just doesn't work. Here, here. Um, any other questions about anything to do with travel, tourism here in Norfolk? Because uh, this is a chance to ask some important questions. I think that it is true that there are people getting here and back, but I think sometimes it's also about perception of access. It's not, like someone said earlier on, it takes an hour to go in London, but people don't think of London as an inaccessible place. And I think we can do something about making a message that it's worth getting, it's worth making that effort to get here. And, and also, the more often you go somewhere, the more accessible it becomes. And that varies in your head, and not just so much physical. I mean, I know you don't want people moaning about the car parking, but, <laughs> but it is, 
it can be it can be a problem. Yes. Yeah. Norwich has got more car parks than the most cities outside of the city. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? I, I think on that perception thing, it's, it's also crucial that the, your team understand it works both ways. So, you know, we still have people involved in the business who talk about London like it's on the moon. And uh, do you know what I mean? And they'll, they'll talk about restaurants and things they read about. And, and I'll say, well, have you been and had a look? And uh, no, no, it's, you know, I, I can't go there. And, and I think it's just as important to get. I'm not, uh, like, I know we're trying to encourage people into the county, but sometimes it's crucial that you encourage your staff to go out to the county and have a look actually what's going on. Restaurant wise, traditionally, as I said, we're always about three years behind what goes on. So you just need to keep an eye on, on, on what's happening there. And for the sake of an hour and a half train journey, you know, you can, you can see all manner of things going on. How, how important do you think it is? I mean, we, we keep hearing about the way the high street is changing, how it has to be an experience coming to the high street. How important, do you think people in Norfolk and Norwich understand how important good food is? Yeah, uh, the, the, the food scene in Norwich has never been better. I mean, it, it is incredible what's happened in the last five, six years. I'm not, I'm not somebody who, who um, feels aggrieved that the chains are here. I think it's a good thing, you know. Uh, nothing sends me crazy when people say, oh, I won't eat in the chain restaurants. It's all a bit of a nonsense, really, because the chains have, have uh, put us on the map. They've certainly, I think, certainly improved the working conditions for most of the staff. Um, it's made staff more difficult to get, but on the flip side, you know, it's certainly made the conditions better for them. And uh, certainly, if you look back six, ten years ago, you know, people would eat out high days and holidays. Now, you know, my daughter claims to have no money, but she seems to eat out four nights a week. So, uh, and that, so it doesn't really matter if it's a chain or what, it just needs to be good food and good service. And I think, again, that's quite a, a, a thing that, that is. I won't say specific in this county, but it is endemic in this county that they, they're frightened of the big boys coming in. And cookery schools are bringing people yeah, into Yeah, huge business for us, huge business for us. It's, uh, I mean, here it's all about income streams here. You know, I've got a huge building and uh, we just need to fill it, basically, and we need to have things going on. Many, many years ago, I, I used to work in my career. It's had a great trajectory. I used to be head chef at the Theatre Royal from 1983 to 1986, and now I've managed to come about 200 yards. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was there in the days of, uh, <laughs> of one of Stephen's predecessors, Dick Condon, and he always taught that you know, you've just got to get the people through the door. It doesn't matter if they're just coming to use the loo, you've got to get them through the door. And that was our mindset from the off here because it was a vast building which was like tumbleweed time, really, and, uh, and that's still the driver, you know, just to get people through the door. Um, hello, everybody. I forgot to give you the Poland answer. Oh, did you? I did. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, but look, I mean, we have, you know, why, why is Poland the uh, second most important market? And that's entirely visiting friends and relatives. And this is actually really crucial in the context of Brexit. Again, whichever side you voted for, be aware that there is a huge amount of tourism both in Norwich and across the rest of the UK which is kind of hidden because it is the idea that you've got uh, people who are visiting their friends and relatives who are working in the UK. It is already the case that a number of, uh, uh, certainly anecdotally talking to tourism businesses, the number of Eastern Europeans is declining and with that will go some tourism, and I'm afraid it gets worse after that because you've then got reduced connectivity from those places because you know, half the routes out of Stansted, for instance, going to Eastern Europe, from, from, from Luton, are there because of the um, number of people working here. Those will gradually start to fall off, and then finally, the uh, uh, taking back control of our borders seems to consist of insisting that everybody has a proper passport that is absolutely stated home office policy rather than an identity card. That takes out about 100 million potential 
European visitors, all of whom have national ID cards, which they can use to get in and out, they won't be able to. Some of them will have passports and they'll still come in. Some may go to the trouble of getting a passport to come to Norwich, but I'm afraid there's three elements of, of Brexit which need to be uh, uh, at least acknowledged. Sorry, we know what to do. Let's talk more about food. No, no. <laughs> I, I think next time I ask people to switch headphones off, that'll include people walking by. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sorry, can I ask you, as you travel over your experience, what catches people's eyes as a destination? Is it novelty, or is it, is it more than that that's going to put Norwich on the map? Oh, uh, what catches your eye? Well, I think this almost kind of goes back to what we're hearing from the excellent twins, and um, uh, in terms of food, it's not necessarily the great set pieces. It's not necessarily the Sainsbury Centre, the cathedral, the lanes. It's more that really good meal you had. It's that. Uh, Somebody you might have met. It's 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 those things. It's it's uh, uh, you know a sign outside a cafe saying please let this be spring. It's just all those little touches I think which goes go together to give you a, a sense that this is a lovely place to be. And what worried me, I've been making note of all the statistics today. The most scary one I think is that seventy four percent of people who visit Norwich. Um, want to come back here. What about the other 26%? I've been choosing, chasing them. And that's actually a serious point uh, that, that people, yeah, like when I first came to Norwich, when I was about 11, and um, been coming back regularly ever since. But you've got to make people not just uh, tell other people that it was great, but want to come back and see other dimensions of the city. Uh, can I ask how many people here read? A blogger or a vlogger or sign up to and, and do they make a difference as to where you decide that you're going to go? And if you're reading a blog, what is it the photograph you look at or what is it? I think it's a mixture of both. I look at the uh, photos and um, I read them for you. So I did a road trip around California last year. And to get an idea of what I what I was going to expect, I read blog after blog of all of their experience because I was camping in Yosemite. I was like, I'm going to like it. I've never camped before, so it's just that first-hand experience for them, which I find more authentic than from reading like Lonely Planet or something like that. More so than say TripAdvisor. I yeah, I'm not a TripAdvisor. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it, it, it's, you're looking for negativity to, to avoid something? No, positive as well. So the problem is, if they're saying, wow, you must see this, and this is a great restaurant, and this is a great hotel, it just helps you to both plan a trip quickly, but also to try and ensure that actually when you go, you've got a great time. Because you said, you're working a lot of time, so I think that's really important as well. I actually trust them more than you do perhaps yeah. when you see them in the publication because I know as the girls are saying they do get back and that's what they do it's a lot. But uh, the narrative seems to be a bit more on your level, so it's a bit more. They put they put how much it costs on. Sometimes, they don't. Well, sometimes, sometimes, yeah, it's absolutely I mean they liked they liked it here. What did they stay here last night? Yes, they yeah, did. they were here. They were very nice about the rooms yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I'll have that, <laughs> and that will that will help. So, do you do you, do you, re do you see that when people are yeah, booking in that yeah. they they've got it from a yeah. blog or a blog? Yeah, yeah, we follow all that relentless, and we are relentless on that. Do you change your menu accordingly? To well, if if somebody said I had great time at the assembly house, room was great, didn't like the. Yeah, of course we listened to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They didn't like the fish. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not saying. It depends who was in the kitchen. But, um, I mean, yeah, we are, we are relentless on, on social media, that's, and that's fairly new for us, probably in the last um, two years. Uh, particularly Instagram is, is our favourite, that's the one we seem to push. But I think the other thing is, particularly on, um, on things like Facebook, um, you know, we do. We spend a lot on photography, do you know what I mean? I, I follow loads and loads of restaurants and my heart sinks when I see poor photography on there. So they've probably given the chef who's just done 
13 hours and he's taking pictures of his food and putting on Instagram. That's no favours to them whatsoever. Yeah. So we spend a lot of money on photography here and, uh, and we have it programmed out. So we did an afternoon tea here in the summer, which um, was, we did eight and a half thousand in five weeks, you know, and that, there was no, the only advertising we did on that was on social media. So all. did you, did you see that in the people that came? Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. they were, they yeah. were in that 18 yeah. to 25? We've already, we've all, we've all, last night we finished our pre theater menu for Les Mis, and we're doing it. As well. And we're doing a themed afternoon tea in there, so yeah. we're already on that. Do you know what I mean? You have to react so quickly because you know these tickets are going on sale, so that's the time to uh, to grab these people. So, so in the dinosaur, when that comes, you know, we'll link into that. You, you just have to be aware of what's going on. But um, we put a single post out two weeks ago for to win afternoon tea for four with some spectacular pictures of our Easter pictures, and we've got two and a half million opens that's on that. I mean that is, uh, and that has cost me two hundred pound on photography, and somebody to sit there and put that out. It's just there, there is a danger, isn't there? Because I, I was looking on my iPhone, you get a little thing to see how much uh, screen time you use yes. every, every week. And I said to uh, Susie, my co-presenter, um, oh, seventeen minutes. She said, a day. Is that all? I said, no, that's the week. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> I thought I thought we'd been on it a lot. So, <laughs> are we the generation that's going to be forgotten? Absolutely, I don't understand it. I don't understand it at all. It's um, beyond me. But um, it's just, just you know, it's, we've we, we've actually cut our marketing budget in half in the last two years. Have you? Uh, because we're all. Because we're just so, all does online. that go for other organisations? Have you cut your spend on? Traditional advertising. Shift. Shift. Yeah. It, it's moved. Right. I suppose you factor in that with pants and do it, but you know, it's that's my wife, so we don't she don't get paid. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Good. But, uh, Any uh, other questions? Can, can I just yes. got, pick up from that very briefly? Uh, it's sort of um, I, I think things are now going full circle because if I may, I showed you that uh, thing from Lonely Planet about how you could only get to Norwich by bus and it took three days or whatever it was. But Lonely Planet, and along with Rough Guys, very trusted brand. Um, and that was what I have always relied upon to have a kind of objective, professional approach to evaluating places. But then you went into TripAdvisor and you've got huge amounts of reviews but you've got no idea where they're coming from. So what uh, Claire and Laura, Twins of Travel, are doing and a number of other very good bloggers is saying that you, you can trust us, we will give you a fair, uh, fa fair representation of what, what, um, how we are seeing the world. And so that has kind of, that kind of curated idea I think is far better than TripAdvisor. And if I may, um, uh, Larkin Gowan have a fantastic um, uh, survey which will tell you everything you need to know about um, social media and lots of other opinions um, about uh, what is going on. And Chris uh, uh, Scargill is here and I'm sure he will be delighted to talk to you. Um, so lots, lots of good stuff. But um, that, I, I think that is the near future anyway. I don't know what the long future is for the price state. I don't even know what's going to happen a week on Friday when we're supposed to leave the EU. <laughs> we'll find out soon enough. Listen, thank you both of you very much indeed. Thank um, and thank you so many of you for coming today.